Sacred Symbols, a PlayStation podcast, is a CastBox original produced in partnership with our friends at Studio 71. CastBox is the fastest growing, highest rated podcast app on both iOS and Android, and all of your favorite podcasts are there, ripe for the downloading. Sacred Symbols is available wherever you get your podcasts, of course, but we hope you'll give CastBox a shot. We think it's pretty rad. To get each episode of Sacred Symbols three days before the public, completely ad-free, please consider supporting the show on Patreon at patreon.com slash Stand. Perks for support include not only getting the show early and ad-free, but you can also gain access to monthly exclusive podcasts, and supporting on Patreon is the only way to get your listener mail read on the air, and much more. Plus, supporting Sacred Symbols on Patreon also nets you perks for other Collins Last Stand shows automatically, including the Nostalgia and Retro Podcast Knockback, the YouTube series dedicated to gaming called SideQuest, and the eclectic interview podcast Fireside Chats. Thank you for your generosity, kindness, and support. Without you, Sacred Symbols and all things Collins Last Stand would not exist. But enough of that. On to the show. Greetings and salutations. Welcome back to Sacred Symbols, a PlayStation podcast. This is episode 45. Whoa. My name is Colin Moriarty. I'm joined as always by Lola's nanny. Chris Reagan, <laughs> how's it going? Uh, I'm okay. How are you? I'm doing okay. Not too shabby. It's exciting because in a few days from when we're recording this, by the time this goes to free feeds, this would have already been in the, in play. This has yeah. already been in play. But uh, for the patrons out there, uh, Chris is watching Lola from Thursday to Sunday, and uh, Aaron and I are going to Massachusetts now. Typically, we would bring Lola, but it is a bit of a pain in the ass. Lola is a bit of a uh, she's a bad flyer. She's a fire. Well, she's she's a depressed flyer. Oh. You know? She, well, we really? put her in a little bag, you know, she like just looks at you, she tr- does anything she can to get out of the bag. We get yelled at by people for letting her out of the bag. You know, it's it's a whole ordeal. It sounds like a, like a, yeah. Like it's a ordeal. whole ordeal. And Lola's all, you know, Boston Terriers are very energetic, so she's always, she just wants to go explore everything and do everything. So anyway, it's just easier for us to not do that. Yeah. So Chris, for, uh, you know, I, I named Chris a sum. I gave Chris my apartment <laughs> and said, Chris, can you simply watch my dog? And he said, yes. So it's we're going to have we're going to see we're going to have a a catch up. Yeah, it should be easy. You know, I'm good with dogs. Yeah, she's a sweetheart. She loves you. I mean, Lola really Lola loves everyone to a degree because she just wants attention. But you can tell I mean, I, you know, Lola's six years old. We've had her for a long time. I've known her for, you know, m- almost four years. She definitely takes the very specific people ex- exceptionally. Yeah. And you're one of those people. We well, call good. you Uncle Chris. <laughs> he She responds to that name. It's so, so weird, you know. Here we go. It'll be a very exciting time for me to see if you are able to handle her. I think yeah, be, so I think it'll be just fine. It should be good. She wants to. She's gonna want to cuddle with you. She wants to sleep with you. I don't want that. I don't want all that. She's definitely gonna want to cuddle. Yeah, that's too bad. You. Oh, all right. Well, that's fair enough. <laughs> I'll just put her in a drawer. Is that okay? Oh, it's like that episode of Seinfeld where the Japanese oh, yeah. tourists come. <laughs> yeah, everything relates back to Seinfeld yeah, of somehow. Course. Of course, that's like where my my the synapses in my brain always route through Seinfeld first. And then it goes to the rest of the brain. That's unfortunately the case with me also. Now, Chris, is everything well in your life? Yeah, I'm exhausted, though, because I woke up at like 7 a.m. because I'm trying to get back on gym time. Oh, oh, I forgot that. So you're working out again. Yeah. Oh, good I, I, I stopped for a couple for like a good month or two because I was like crunching out videos. And now I'm just like kind of like trying to get back into it. But like, man, getting up early is terrible. Yeah. Well, I mean, but why not just do it on your own schedule? Ah, uh, cause, cause my friends go early in the day. Oh, so you go with friends? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and if it, if I go later, I'm like, ah, nobody's going. I might not. I just might not go. See, you I know? don't have any friends, so I don't have to worry about that. <laughs> you know. Now you look very fit. Well, so it's because I got I, I'm covered in black clothes. Right. Where you can't see slim, me. They're very. Slimming. I'm wearing a beanie right now because it's are. winter to me. For some you are. Reason. You look a little bit like Delson from uh, Infamous Three, Infamous Second Son. With a little beanie on, you, you know, that's no. such a specific reference. It is. It is a very. Spe- this is, old, this is an sp- old game at this point. It is. Oh, but it is a PlayStation podcast, so it's a courting. I know. It's it's 2014. It was only it's still a good game, not great. The other infamous games were better. Well, I'm excited for you because you know Aaron and I are going to a wedding. And speaking of fitness, so I I bought a brand new, really nice suit in 2016, and uh, it's it's it looks like a very Mad Menish. Uh, it's a very nice suit. Yeah. And I was in decent shape in 2016, so I, I have to go to this wedding. I never wear suits. So I got my, all right, I'll go try on this suit. So the pants fit, like, okay, but the I, I can't barely button the, the jacket. Oh, so geez. I was having, like, a meltdown because I'm like, I don't I have, like, three suits, and I'm like, I don't want to buy another fucking suit, right? Like, I, I don't wear suits. I think I look 
you know, everyone looks good in a suit. Yeah. So it's like fun to wear them once in a while, but I don't need to wear suits all the time. But then I had a revelation that in 2015, I was in my best friend from home from Long Island's wedding, Mike Pope. We all wore these gray suits. And I'm like, I wonder if I fit into that gray suit. So were you, I took were that you bigger suit. that year? Who knows? Because I wasn't chronicling anything, but I fit in that suit. I can button the button. It's a little snug. I got to go bring the pants in to probably get like a half inch taken out of them. You know, you gonna do all that in the next couple of days. Oh, if you bring the, the place around the corner, you bring it to them by 11. They'll give it to you the next day. Damn. Or the same day. I'm sorry. The same day. So actually, if I bring it to them this afternoon, indeed, I might even have it tomorrow. It just shows how much I don't do that. I thought that that would take a lot longer. It typically it traditionally would. The, I used to go to this really awesome Chinese dry cleaner in San Francisco. And the woman in there used to be like really honest. Uh, and uh she I was like, I, I used to go in and be like, I want to take an inch or two out of this. Whatever, and she'd be like, oh, no, you know, like or I'd be like, I'd be like, I want a half an inch an inch. And she'd be like, no, full inch. So like that. And it reminds me of my friend Nick's story about how a, a, dry, a dry cleaner once told him that she would have to take out his pants all the way for him to uh, wow. for him to fit. That was her answer all the way. <laughs> Good Lord. <laughs> it's a tailoring podcast now. Yeah. Chris, I want to thank everyone for supporting our Shades of Blue initiative. Yeah, how's that patch. going? So it's over now. Uh, we're going to get a final count on how me- how well we sold, but I think we raised quite a bit of money uh, for this Shades of Blue initiative. So thank you all out there for purchasing a patch, and uh, that money goes to a good, co- good, good cause. Good cause. Holy shit. <laughs> it's like I'm back on the island. So yeah, everything goes good to- towards a good cause, and it- it's all good. So I, I want to thank everyone for that, because it's-, it's not something that you had to do, but a lot of you chose to do that, and it's important that we, we rectify our stigmatisms with mental health yeah stigmatisms i don't know if that that's the right word no stigmas stigmas what's Stigmatiz- stigmatism a, st- a stigmatism is a uh, an eye related disease it's a stigmatism it, i've always so it's a stigmatism right a stigmatism it's, it's is an the word. astigmatism or is it a stigmatism I don't, think, I don't think it's an astigmatism it's a stigmatism so like you're, it's, you can't have one single astigmatism oh okay i didn't know, you know I, what i mean yeah yeah i guess i've because i never heard it said well i guess I've never seen it written Without someone saying astigmatism, yeah, there's other ways to use, but I've never heard them. Uh, yeah, yeah. So I didn't You're know if it was like stigmas and astigmatism. It's a grammar podcast now. We're circling the bases. I don't even know. We're circling the fucking toilet is what we're doing. <laughs> Chris, I also wanted to shout out Peter Mayhew real quick. He died. Yeah, Chewbacca. So I thought that was kind of sad. It has yeah, nothing this... to do with PlayStation, but he's been in all of our lives. Yeah, that's really sad. Yeah, he's a, a large man. I didn't realize that he didn't play Chewbacca in. Uh, Episode eight. I yeah, I didn't know that either. Apparently, he like trained some uh, successor, some some fake Chewbacca, some some faker, some. F- <laughs> but R.I.P. Peter Mayhew. Obviously, we're all Star Wars fans. We all love that. And hey, Chris, merchandise, tinyurl.com slash sacred shirts, tiny t i n y u r l dot com slash sacred shirts. You guys can go check out the merch launched last week. It's all T-shirts, print on demand, high quality, made in America. And remember, if you go to Patreon and look up the post that I, you know, you don't have to be a Patreon, a Patreon member to do this. Go find the post that I made for the merch embedded within are the links to high res versions, all the logos. You can do whatever the fuck you want. With them. Just don't sell anything or make any money on it. Yeah. I'm coming for you. <laughs> he you will come for you. I will come for you. I live for petty shit, like coming for people. I've seen him humble people on the streets for much less. Chris. Boxcar wrote into us on Patreon. And remember, all of you can support us on Patreon and patreon.com slash Collins Last Stand to get the show three days early, ad free, and submit your questions, comments, concerns, thoughts, and ideas, exclusive podcasts, etc. Couldn't do it without you. Boxcar says, Hey, fellas, is there anything worse than walking through a spider web? Oh, yeah, several things. Yeah, being funny. trapped in a Chilean mine. Yeah. Uh, being decapitated slowly mm. by uh, radicals. Right. Stepping in a puddle with socks on. Hmm. All those things I think are worse <laughs> monumentally. I think that spider webs don't bother me that much, really. They bother me only if I'm unaware that there could be a spider in the web, because then the spider's on you. Yeah, but the, sp- the spiders aren't going to kill you. No, but they're unless they're in Australia where they scoop your face out why while you ma- sleep. Why did evolution make spiders so scary looking? If we're not supposed to be mortified by every movement they make. I think we're just afraid in, inherently of insects, biologically speaking, because they scutter. Mm. And ancestrally speaking, that's probably not the best thing to see. Nothing that scutters is good. That's why in horror films, a lot of times the monster will like skip frames. You're right. There's a reason for that. It's like it's unsettling deeply like to our ape brains. It makes like... Yeah. Kind of like clicking noises. Sometimes it looks silly though. Have you, have you seen the Babadook? 
No, I don't There's think There's a so. scene where like it scuttles to the, to, towards the camera and just looks so stupid. <laughs> it's really poorly done. You really love using that word. I don't know that I've ever heard that word what? used in this. Scuttle. It, well, that's the only way that I can think of. What is it? Yeah. I don't know. I don't know that word. Is it like a little uh, centipede? They scuttle, scuttle up towards you. Oh, okay. I only know scuttling like you scuttle a ship. You know, that means Ships? destroying your own ship. Oh, yeah, I guess so. You're, <laughs> I guess you, you pay more attention to military terms. <laughs> yeah, exactly. This is, all, again, all routing through Colin's brain, right? So it doesn't, I'm not saying this is normal. But yes, there are several things worse than spider <laughs> Yeah, Walking would, through a spider I would agree with you as well. I, I am horrified of spiders, but I, I, again, like nuclear war, EMP explosion. Yeah. I mean, Irradiated air. Chernobyl. 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 That we should make a, we should <laughs> sure. make a child's mobile called Chernobyl. <laughs> <laughs> and it's it's like little nuclear radiation signs and like yeah, bombs dilapidated, and dilapidated buildings. That's a great idea. That is a great idea. Tremobil. Oh, I love that. You, one of you guys, I don't have time to pursue that business opportunity. So one of you guys can take that. Yeah, we'll throw it to the run. Wind. Run with it. Sergio DeVivo wrote in and said, hey, Chris, so Persona 5, the Royal just announced a grappling hook to use inside the dungeons. You're running out of excuses now. Give the people what they want. It seems like uh, <sighs> is, this is true. This is high demand for some reason. For me to play Persona 5 The Royal, specifically. Not even Persona 5. People but don't give a shit about that game anymore. Screw that game. They want you to play the longer special edition version yeah. of the game? I don't know, man. There is something weird about Persona 5. Or just Persona fans generally. They really want you to play Persona. They really, my roommate, really want My roommate screams about, screams about it all the time. And I'm like, just like, I, I don't care. I don't know. Maybe when I'm crippled. When I'm like it's stuck in a chair like Xavier, right? Then and I can't do any. Oh, I can't run track like I used to. <laughs> I've never run track. It's bullshit. <laughs> but like I don't know, maybe, maybe I don't, I'll give it a shot. They are very persistent. They are persistent, and they have to be persistent for a reason, right? It's got to be good. I'm sure it is. I mean, I have no doubt that it's good. It's just it's a time sink. It's just a time sink. Yeah. And I think that there's a big difference even between a 50 hour time sink and a hundred hour time sink. Oh, in yeah. my mind, I could do a 50 hour time sink. I could do that. Yeah. At age 34, I'm fit enough to do that. What was a 50 hour time? For? God, was God of War 50 hours or was it like? Four? No, probably a little low, like 30, 35. God of War, really? Yeah. That's Spider all, Man like, was like 20, 25 to God, 100%. God of War it. felt way longer than 20, 20 than Spider Man. It was. Like 30, 30 35, mile. I think. Maybe maybe someone can write in and say they spent 50 hours with God of War. Right, I guess maybe. it's possible. I guess they do have that end game stuff too with the dungeons and all that. Yeah, I did it all. Yeah. All right. But 50 hours, I don't know when the last time I spent 50 hours. I spent 50 hours with Bloodborne, probably. I didn't even beat it. Red Dead, I'm sure, it was probably up oh, yeah. to that. Yeah. Probably more like 70, I would say, there. Yeah. yeah, so there you go. Andres Avalos wrote in with Chris and said, Hey, Colin and Chris. Colin, from what I can tell, you eat and enjoy McDonald's on a regular basis. Chris, on the other hand, just ranked McDonald's as a D-list fast food chain <laughs> on his recent ranking, being placed below Burger King. I did. Of all things. I am deeply disturbed. Help him. So this this he says help list, him. So this tiering list is. Did you see this tier list? This comes from Idubs. Idubs made one, and then like Ethan uh, from H three H three made one. And I was like, I didn't like their their lists at all, so I corrected them, and made I think objectively the best one. Is it on your Twitter account? It's on a second. I have it on the second channel that I keep forgetting. Oh, so about. it's a video. Okay, it is a video. Okay. Because I figured, why the and hell not? So, and so you rated McDonald's in the. Let's see. He says you put it in the D list. Yeah, I wish I, I wish I could remember what the hell the. What was your A list? My five S, guys? my S list was was five guys and I think Jersey Mike's. Jersey Mike's. Jersey Mike's. Wow, that's out of left field, huh? It's so good. Jersey Mike's makes a good steak, like a good gr cheese, like steak. They, they make like if you get an Italian sub from Jersey Mike's, it's like some of the best shit ever. It's so good. Jersey Mike's bothers me because it, it's got such a specific menu. It seems so inflexible to me. It is. Yeah, I would say that's accurate. I want to go in and like, because they, their bread looks good and they're good, you know, their meats look good and stuff. I want to go in and just be like, I want this, 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 this. Like you do at Subway. Now, I would rather literally kill myself than have to eat Subway anymore. Subway, Subway, Subway was the lowest. I, the, was the lowest. I haven't had Subway in years. You, It would have to be the most dire, dire circum. Like it would have to be an earthquake. I haven't eaten. It's in really days. terrible. It's fucking terrible. Dude, Subway sucks. McDonald's was in D tier along with Domino's, Papa John's, and In-N-Out. In-N-Out in the D tier? Yes. I don't. I agree with you that In-N-Out is vastly overrated, but not D tier. It's D tier What else me. is in the D tier? Uh, McDonald's? McDonald's, Domino's, and Papa John's. Domino's, Papa John's. Yeah, okay. 
And then below that was Subway and Little Caesars and like E. And then F was like Arby's and Dairy Queen and Sonic. Sonic specifically because I haven't been to Sonic. I've Dairy only been Queen. to one Sonic and I didn't really care for it. I don't know that. So you put Sonic and Dairy Queen as Fs? I don't know about that. That seems a little harsh. You ever been to, have you ever been to Dairy Queen? Yeah. I've never liked a single thing from Dairy Queen. Like, they're fine. I mean, I, it's, it's fine. It's fine. Is it better than Subway? Yeah. Eh, I, I think so. I think so. And then I had like, I don't know, C was like just the g- generic shit, like Taco Bell, Pizza Hut, Wendy's, okay. Jack in the Box, and Burger King. Okay. Burger King I, was above McDonald's specifically because they're chicken fries. And that's it. Oh, you like those? I like those. And then they discontinued them and brought them back and, and didn't do it right. So like. I've been on a Jack in the Box kick, dude. I've been Literally. on a Jack in the Box kick too. But only re- because they're open like way late, they're, yeah, like way they, later than a lot of other places are. The ju- what do they call the j- the double jack burger? The bun on the double jack burger is like the best fast food bun, dude. It's so good. It's like so. Soft. It is really it's, good. It's almost like a pretzel roll, like almost like a pretzel roll. It's pretty close. It's yeah. like nice and fluffy. It's probably five hundred grams of carbs. I down two of those like at ten o'clock last night. It was great. But yeah, McDonald's sucks. McDonald's is complicated. <laughs> you got real serious there. That was like a debate because they're debate are, ready stance. It's so funny. This came up because my brother and I were talking on a podcast recently that Burger King is really tough for me because I really like Burger King, but it's really hard to find a good Burger King. That's the problem. It's hard to find a good one because like the, the Whopper is a great sandwich. But like, or, or even the chicken, the long like submarine chicken sandwich, like that classic chicken sandwich, that's a good stuff. But it's it's like Taco Bell. Like Taco Bell is pretty good, but it's just ha- like Taco Bell is just awful because the restaurants are gross. Yeah, the people there don't care. That's the, kind it, of the problem with Burger King. Like I remember exactly. liking Burger King a lot in in when I lived in Yonkers, and then like the second I moved upstate, it was like, what the hell is this? You just got to find a good one. Not my Burger King hashtag. Yeah, not my Burger King. No, no. <laughs> I've only really known of one or two good Burger Kings in my life. I and, think same. But and, those one or two good Burger Kings were so good. Exactly. They were consistent. So that that's a huge problem with me. But McDonald's is so... Here's the thing about McDonald's. It's consistent, reliable garbage. It's consistent, reliable, and it can be garbage. But if you get... A, like the McDonald's down the street for me is like one of the good McDonald's. And I get it delivered sometimes. There's nothing better than McDonald's french fries that are like the good McDonald's french fries. They're nice and hot. They're a little crisp. They're salty. They're, they have ke- chemically engineered that fucking french fry to be the perfect have you ever had fry. fries from Buffalo Wild Wings? I have. Those are really good when you can go to a good one. I like to get the fries there and dip them in the garlic sauce. The gar- like the. I'm getting hungry now. I don't need to. <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> this, is a bad, this is a bad way to start a, start a podcast, actually, now that I think about it. What were we Fuck, talking I'm about? I'm so hungry. How did we even get on this? I have no idea. Finally, Benjamin Orlani, or Orleano. Close enough. Pied Lobo. I think I might have might have done okay there. It says, Dearest Colin and Chris, gentlemen, keepers of symbols most sacred. I come bearing a question that I believe has been on the minds of most listeners. When are you bringing a guest to host an episode? I thoroughly enjoy your back and forth so much that I became a patron, but every once in a while, I'd like to hear a new perspective, perhaps from someone who would disagree with the two of you. And I believe I have the best man for the job. Jesus Christ. Tom Sweeney. I firmly believe that El Suino will bring new perspectives and discuss with logic and reason the issues presented. I became convinced of this after I watched the space debate on Chris's channel, where Tom destroyed Chris with logic and facts in a polite, calm and collected manner. The eloquence of Tom's arguments were so strong that Chris's only response when faced with the overwhelming force of reason was to hurl a chair at his roommate, proving that Tom was right all along. I'm starting a hashtag on Twitter, but I can't decide which one I should use. It's either Sweeney for symbols or Sacred Sweeney. Hashtags. I like hashtag Sweeney for symbols. I think both would work. Thank you for an amazing podcast. Keep making Tuesdays great again. Good Lord. That's your roommate. <laughs> that is my roommate. The person who, he's talking about, not the person will, who, who, with overwhelming conviction, will say things that are completely wrong. Like the sun is closer to the earth or, for, or farther away from the earth than Pluto is. <laughs> and remain convinced of it despite obvious, obviously that's wrong. He's, 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 that's he's a wrong, character. Yes. He's a character for sure. As far as guests, I don't know. I, I don't really. I I got kind of disagree. I don't really want guests on the show. I have no problem with yeah. uh, us doing like a special episode where I interview someone or you interview someone. And and there might be a time where Chris has to cool. do the episode by himself, or I have to do the episode by myself, you know, or with another person. Yeah. But I I'm of the mind that this is our show. I just don't really. I don't get the clamoring for guests personally. Yeah, I've never really been a, that big of a fan of guests on pretty much anything yeah well, on any, like youtube channel or like any podcast i'm like ah it's somebody else i gotta get used to this now i gotta acclimate myself to this person's cadence it's all it's, it's all work on my on my behalf and i know we as work, a listener we work enough 
And the the thing if is, if Colin is ever sick, though, I'll bring Sweeney in here and we'll do it. Yeah, and be I'll fun. be the reader, and he'll have to figure out what the hell. Yeah, you can write the episode. how far Pluto is. Yeah, that'll be. I, I mean, that's that's. I would say that's probable. That's eventually going to happen at some point. I, I'm sure, but I can only think about the experiences of the podcast I listen to. I don't like when guests are on the like I, unless it's a guest centric podcast. If I'm listening to like a panel podcast, I just want to hear them. That's why I'm listening. I don't want to hear some fucking random yeah. person. It reminds me of like when uh, a lot of YouTube channels would do collab collaborations, but the collaborations would last the entirety of the video as opposed to just being like quick like cameos or like or like kind of like supplementary kind of things. Because then it's like. Oh, hey, a new video for my favorite content creator. Oh, it's 20 minutes. Sick. And it's like just 20 minutes of just like somebody that I just don't know. And like, ah, who's what is this? Yeah, it's too much. We're not doing that here. Get out of here. No, I'm only stay around, Benjamin. Thank you, Chris. It's time to talk about what we're playing. We're only uh, we're almost 20 minutes into the show already. So oh, shit. We, we really <laughs> good Lord, uh, Chris, before we get into that, Gordon wrote into us on Patreon and said, when will you try dreams? And he did the little clap thing. Oh, when yeah, did, will yeah. you try dreams? Really search hashtag made in dreams on Twitter. I know dreams won't speak to the masses, but there is seriously some impressive shit in there. Think you'll be pleasantly surprised. Stay classy. Oh, no, I've seen some imp impressive stuff already. Honestly, I haven't even seen it in the PlayStation store. Like for real. Like, I don't think I've seen it in like the like it's not being promoted. It's not being promoted. So I think I just straight up forgot that it was out. And they haven't really done a good job of like advertising it either. It's like mostly Days Gone stuff. It's out there. It's out. It's out and about. Let's yeah, say. I'll get to it. I'll, I'll try and get to it this week. I, I just straight up actually for real just forgot about it. Yeah, I mean, do what you got. I mean, I'm of the mind that we should play what we want to play. I have no interest in playing it. And uh, I'm, I'm, I hope it does great. I do want to play it. So we'll, Chris will play it and he'll report back. Yeah. But let's talk about what we're playing now. Chris, I played Days Gone. And we already talked extensively about that, by the way, the Spoiler cast is now live for all. If you guys want to listen to it, it's a spoiler cast. Yeah. I don't want to hear any complaints. If one person t complains to me that there was spoilers in the spoiler cast, we're never sacred symbols is canceled. <laughs> it would just protest. I'm not doing sacred symbols anymore. Totally. Done. But so I platinum days gone uh, and I enjoyed doing that. But you and I are both playing the original borderlands. And I have to say now that it's on PS4, it's the first time I've played it in almost 10 years. It came out in the fall of 2009 mm -hmm. and so September, I think. Yeah. Something of this nature. So it's been a long time. It's and been a while. It is incredibly nostalgic for me. That's that's the word that comes to mind for me. The music especially really brings me back to that time. Well, like I, the Cage the Elephant intro or just like the or just the ambient I really sound. I really should say the score. Like the, the score. Yeah. The scoring is just like, yeah, there's a lot of it just brings me back. There's just it, Borderlands 2 is a similar thing where they wrote music in that in that game that felt very moody and nostalgic and very appropriate. It, it crescendos and goes away. You don't really think about it. So I actually really like that component of the game. But it's held up really well. Cell shading just really holds up. And I know that they they probably tweaked it and fixed it. I think they added like a few tweaks to the I'm sure UI. there's like anti-aliasing that they've added yeah. and like just upper, upper resolutions and like maybe some tweaks to environmental detail. But cell sh yeah, the game looks pretty great still because it's so stylized. Yeah, it's great. How far are you in in the game? Oh, man, I think I'm level I'm I think level 27 or something. It's I've been I've been hammering it out like in between other things, but I really like and I really appreciate how the story of that game really gets out of your way. And like you can like there's there's things that I remember that I completely like missed the first time playing. It's like, oh, shit, I didn't even realize that character died because I was too busy just talking to my friends on mic and just like killing things and leveling up. I had no idea that there was even really a narrative there. So it's kind of cool going back and like kind of like, oh, yeah, that happened. And this is it's nice. It's fun. It's there's something really satisfying too about leveling up in that game. Yeah, it's great. It's like man. it really hits that sweet spot of like you got that level up like the big ass text mm -hmm. and like it's like almost Scott Pilgrim arcadey looking. Yeah, it feels good. I th I still think the shooting is a little a little awkward sometimes, especially with some of those weapons that don't feel like there's any recoil at all. But uh, it's a satisfying game to play, and it's and it's actually yeah, it held up pretty well. I yeah, think the, a, the second one's obviously far superior. It is, but. I don't think it's at all unplayable. No, it's it's really, really fun, I think. And and I recommend people go get it. It was I got it for 20, I think, but I think it was on sale. I think it's thirty dollars normally the download. What class are you playing? Uh, soldier. I always play the like the normal guy. I played you know, the like, siren this time. I think I played I think I played Mordecai the first time when I played like the, the guy with the, the blood wing. Yeah, yeah. Now I'm playing the siren. It's like wild. I totally forgot that you could just <laughs> phase walk and like go invisible and like run 10,000 miles an hour. 
Yeah, so I, cool. I, I just always default to the dude with the machine gun, pretty much, or the dude with the assault rifle. I don't know why in these class-based games. I don't think, in fact, in any of the in any border. Well, I guess just the two Borderlands games. I've always played just that character. I don't think I've ever even tried. Siren's fun, yeah. man. The other ones. Uh, yeah, I, I will probably try all three. I'd like to get the platinum in this, so I have to play all three just to do like their special skills. So, so I might get to that point. But uh, yeah, really fun game, and I agree with you. There's really cool narrative threads that you can follow or not like i like that th there's like multiple quests that all tie into this like archaeologist this female archaeologist that like goes to pandora and it's basically about her losing her mind yeah um and it's so you like follow her trail over multiple side quests which i think is really cool and uh i i just like the shooting i, I think the shooting feels good for the time yeah and it's so funny playing it because i i guess we kind of lost sight of and it's kind of a shame gearbox is kind of a controversial studio now but they really did start all this in a way, like all this all looter shooter thing. Yeah, actually, I hated it in the Borderlands ad for this PS4 version of the game. It says like the original looter shooter and stuff like that. But they're right. It really is like the original no, yeah. or one of them. And, and, it, and I remember playing Borderlands and being like, wow, I didn't know that you can play a shooter and, and have it be a role playing game. Like it just felt so weird to me. And yeah. so it's definitely an important game. I suggest people go back and play it. Yeah. And it's, it's weird. It, the game is it really is just a bunch of checklists. But it's something about it is just satisfying in how, in how simple it is. It's not like this overcomplicated, like, go open up your codec and f f find the lost souls of the ether. And it's like, nah, just find these parts of a gun barrel. Go, yeah, you know, yeah, go into the, don't go into detective mode and search the ground for five years. Yeah. Looking for whatever it is you're looking for. You're absolutely right. You know, one of the most satisfying things I find in the game is like going to the bounty boards and there's like seven things. So I select them all and then I finish them all and then I turn them all at, in at, at once. the same time. Yeah. So it's just like, ding. It is a super satisfying. And you got like a shit ton of experience points. Yeah. Very I, I've been doing the same exact thing. I've yeah. been like hoarding uh, quests and it's then cool, just man. turning them all in. It's good. One complaint, uh, vehicle driving is terrible in that game. I remember it being terrible in the original too. I, I don't understand. It's literally inversed. Like you're literally, I think, doing some sort of locomotion, I think, with the right stick. It's like it's something weird where it just doesn't feel right. Whatever it is. I don't remember what it is. It's it, really awkward because it controls in the way that Halo's vehicles control. Like you move the stick to, to move it. But for some reason, it just feels way, way wrong. Yeah, it's not, <laughs> I don't know what the hell it is. It's not good. That, that's definitely really floaty. Good. Chris, that's all we're playing for now, though. Mm -hmm. And so it's time to jump into the news. All righty. If you don't mind. I do. I'm excited to hear what you have to say about this first one. OK. Number oh. one. <laughs> People are very unhappy with Sonic the Hedgehog's portrayal in the upcoming live action cartoon fusion film aptly named Sonic the Hedgehog. Indeed, people are so upset by his portrayal and have complained so loudly and so forcefully about it that the filmmakers are acceding to the fans. Jeff Fowler, the film's director, tweeted, quote, thank you for the support and the criticism. The message is loud and clear. You aren't happy with the design and you want changes. It's going to happen. Everyone at Paramount and Sega are fully committed to making this character the best he can be. Hashtag Sonic movie. Hashtag gotta fix fast. End quote. Then Yuji Naka, who helped create the Sonic character games and brand, tweeted out, quote, The power of Sonic fans is amazing. It is good to go in a good direction. Thank you so much for loving Sonic, end quote. I love that. The film is due out on November 8th, and it seems that the parties involved want to keep that timeline intact, hence the gotta fix fast hashtag. Jeff Fowler is a newbie film director who won an Academy Award for a short animated film about 15 years ago. He may be wise to listen to the fans. Yuji Naka, on the other hand, no longer has anything to do with Sega or Sonic. He left the company in 2006, briefly worked on his own projects at a smaller studio, and now works at Square Enix. So... I think we can all objectively agree that that Sonic was horrifying. Yeah, it was pretty bad. What do you think? I, I don't know how I feel. I mean, I, I kind of appreciate it. I guess I, they're going to fix it. It's nice. It's a nice thought. But then the fact that they're not pushing the date means that they're just really kind of overworking a lot of animators to get something done real quick that probably should take a lot longer. It's. It's. I saw a really good, like, I don't know if it was an onion or like one of those, like, one of those other satire sites that said like, oh, the new Sonic movie is going to be the first uh, video game adaptation to f uh, faithfully recreate the industry's crunch problem, <laughs> which I thought was pretty clever. That is funny. Man. But like, I'm all for giving these things a shot, but there's no way that this movie is going to be good. And I don't see the reason. I just don't see the point in fixing it. Like, I would rather be won over by something that's awful looking than just have a, a better looking Sonic in a movie that still ultimately just fails at everything it tries to do. I don't know. Maybe that's just my cynicism, and I feel like they're just kind of overworking animators for little to no benefit, uh, but I don't know. We'll, it, we'll see. It is interesting to watch the two sometimes in concert arguments being made 
and trying to rectify the two. Like yeah. we want agency over the characters. We want the creators to listen to us. But in listening to us, there are realities on the ground that must be met, right? Yeah. Like business realities and all those kinds of things. I'm kind of in agreement with you that it's probably impossible for them to push it based on the money spent. They probably already have their marketing budget. For all we know, like that the money's already in play. There's like, a conspiracy there's, that they that this isn't even the real design. They put it out there to get people talking about it, and they've already had like a fixed design. Maybe, <laughs> which maybe. I wouldn't even be surprised. It's like a marketing ploy that's actually pretty smart. The thing to me is that uh, to your point they might just have other versions of Sonic that they fucked around with. So maybe they're not starting literally from scratch. Maybe they're like, oh, we have like these other designs and at least we can now integrate this, this these designs and we have somewhere to start from. I, I don't know how I feel about the internet changing the, the design of something that's established though. Also, it's kind of like, It'd be like if God of War was really, was announced and it, like Kratos was like, oh, he's an old man. It's like, oh, I don't like that. I don't like him being old. Ah, I want him to be young again. And, and they were like, oh, we're sorry. We're, we'll make him young again. It's like, eh. maybe let it maybe just let it be whatever it is that I'm kind of of that mind, too. I feel like I'm splintered in a lot of different ways with this because I don't I don't like the idea of like an audience like forcing change on a on a group of creatives. Yeah, I'm not also. crazy about it either. But it's also Sonic, so I don't care. Right, exactly. <laughs> you know, it's like I'm all over the place with this specific story. Well, I'm, an, I'm, a, I'm a similar mind in the sense that and I don't mean, I guess it is mean inherently, but, <laughs> you know. <laughs> I know this is already going. Sonic's always, like we said, like our, my opinion is Sonic has always been bad. So this, cul- this film is the culmination. Like when I saw that, I was like, yeah, of course. You know, that, that was kind of my opinion. I was, I was like, yeah, of course this looks fucking terrible. Of course it looks terrible. Jim Carrey looks great <laughs> at the end there. Yeah, I guess. I don't know. I, I'm excited if people are excited. I want everyone to love everything that, that that they're excited about. But yeah, I'm torn a little bit on it, too. I was kind of in on something like this a long time ago when they revealed Sucker Punch revealed Infamous 2's Cole, the protagonist. And we complained loudly on Podcast Beyond. And we were definitely in, we were definitely involved in help and in getting that changed. In a major way. We, in fact, might have been like the only force that that made them change that. So I I can't I don't want to sit around and act like I've never been, you know, aghast and I, I wasn't nerdy about shit in the past. Oh, yeah. I was. No, I can't even really faithfully make this argument because I, I, I was one of the few people when like Halo 4 came out. It's like that looks that's a terrible Master Chief design. What are you doing? He looks terrible. And now they fixed it. And now I'm happy about it. So well, I, don't, I don't know. I can't even I can't. I, have, I'm, I, can't, I don't have a leg to stand on with this. You can't even keep yourself happy. Yeah. Number two on the back of the news about the Sonic movie's poor reception is Sega's fiscal report for its corporate year ending March 31st. While sales are up 5.6 year on year, according to website Gamasutra, operating income was down a staggering 33.6%. That said, the company still posted a company-wide profit of nearly $89 million, which while in the black isn't great for a corporation of its size. Sega grossed $366.4 million from digital game sales and $490.3 million from retail game sales for the year for 23.4 million total units sold, which is actually higher than the 17.3 million sold the year before. Sega blames its financial position from failing to launch a full quarter of its planned portfolio for the fiscal year. While intending to have 12 games in total from March to March, they instead only got eight of them out. So this could be another reason why they really don't want to move the movie. Yeah, this this might have something massive to do with their bottom line. So I wanted to kind of put those stories in concert since I think they speak to each other. Whether or not they do is up for your interpretation. Number three, Sony has revealed PlayStation Plus's free game offerings for the month of May 2019. If you have an active PS Plus account, you can grab the adventure game What Remains of Edith Finch, as well as the hectic multiplayer game Overcooked. Uh, By the way, Overcooked 2 won our Let's Play vote. So we're going to be playing that in the coming weeks. Oh, my God. Uh, I think we'll play the original Overcooked, too. That will be those games make people want to kill each other. So <laughs> I'm looking forward That'll to that. That'll be then. fun. Uh, let's see what remains of Edith Finch comes from the indie team Giant Sparrow. And it was originally being incubated as an internal PlayStation exclusive project following the release of the Unfinished Swan in 2012, which was a PlayStation exclusive as well. Sony ultimately dropped the project several years into development. And after its reveal, Though Giant Sparrow hooked up with the tiny publisher Annapurna Interactive to get the game out in April of 2017. Overcooked, on the other hand, was a very popular multiplayer game by Ghost Town Games and recently got a sequel aptly named Overcooked 2. I like that it's called Overcooked with an exclamation point, too. Because that's exactly how Destroying Humans was. Yeah, over, yeah Overcooked 2. <laughs> I don't like uh, Edith Finch that much. I think it's overrated. I, I didn't I didn't care for it a great I've, deal. I've never played it. Uh, as far as Overcooked... That's a walking sim, right? Yeah. yeah. As far as Overcooked is concerned, great game. Really great game. So you guys can have that to look forward to. But Anthony Gigi wrote into us, Chris, 
On Patreon, it says, hello, gentlemen. PS Plus games from May have been announced, and I'm yet again disappointed. Ever since Sony dropped PS3 and Vita, I believe the value of PS Plus games would increase, but they've actually had the opposite effect. Do you think the release of PS5 Sony will start adding more free games to the service? I rarely play online, and I will gladly keep my $60 if they don't do something to make the service worthwhile within the next year. Thank you, gentlemen. Say, and Colin, say hi to Lola for me. She's a good gal. She is. I have to agree. This actually might be the wor single worst month for PlayStation Plus games ever. Since 2000, since PlayStation Plus launched in 2011, yeah. this might literally be the worst free games offering ever. Well, you are getting less value because they're giving you literally less. That's true, <laughs> but you're pretty... also not getting one. You're not even getting any AAA games. You're getting two twenty or fifteen dollar games. At least one of them is great. Yeah, Overcooked is a great game at the very least. So that's like fifty percent of something. But it's also not that I have a problem with this, Chris. But Overcooked is also being released to promote Overcooked too. So it's it, there's true, something yeah. in there as well. Where, I don't know, I just feel like you should have an expectation that you're going to get something big every month. Even if it's just one big game and then something smaller. I just don't think, like, Edith Finch and, and Overcooked are both great games to include, but it should be Edith Finch and something big. It should be Overcooked and something big. Not them together. I, I think this is bad. They're really sucking the value out of this now at this point. It sucks. Yeah. Especially when you look at what Xbox is doing with games with gold and stuff. They're just getting way better games. Michael Dudek, or no, he actually, ha, this guy actually wrote it and said I was saying his name wrong. I'm trying to remember. Let's what? say Michael Dudich. Dudich? Say hi, CNC. So with the news of PlayStation Online being extremely profitable, when do you think we can expect to see some actual improvements to the PSN and PS Store? The PS Store is especially bad. The store on the console doesn't have the wish list I created in the browser. The store in the browser displays an error whenever I try to make a purchase. So I have to buy games through the console, but that doesn't have my wish list, so I have to search manually. When I do a search for a game in the browser, like say The Last of Us, the six search results are add-ons, themes, and avatars. So I will, if I want the actual game, I have to click on see all results and then wade through a full page and a half of add-ons, themes, and avatars. In other words, bullshit, before I find the actual goddamn game. And don't get me started on those download speeds. In what alternate reality is this acceptable? Clearly, PlayStation's online infrastructure is awful from top to bottom. Do you think Sony will actively pursue something resembling a modern, all-encompassing solution, or will they continue to not care as long as they're making money? Rant over. Thanks, and keep up the good work. Wow, Michael is upset today, Chris. Yeah, geez. What do you find about his arguments? I mean, the place... You are a user of both ecosystems in a way that I'm not. So, I mean, talk to me a little bit about that. Does the PlayStation Store... Does the PlayStation Store provide you hurdles that you don't see elsewhere? I... As far as like searching goes, I haven't really noticed that big of a problem searching for things, but like I do think Xbox and PlayStation both need like serious, serious overhauls of their stores. Like, I don't know specifically what they could do though, aside from just making things more responsive and a little bit more context sensitive making sure that the first result isn't an add on, but that's a problem on, on Xbox as well. Let's say, so it's not a matter of like, you know, oh, Xbox has been making money for way longer, which is why it's better. It's like, yeah, it's better, but like, it's not, it's not immune to all the same problems. I'm in some agreement with you here in the sense that what they have is like this static thing. We have to remember the PlayStation Store originally started as a browser, if people remember on PS3. Yeah. So it was, it, we've come a long way. I will say that I'm not trying to make excuses for Sony, but we've come a long way. And even with searching, searching is much improved like over the last year because they got rid of that radial and all that kind of that weird ass shit they were doing on the PlayStation Store. But I tweeted out a while ago, like the PlayStation Store never works. That's my major yeah. thing. And it got retweeted and like so many times and people like chiming in that I know this is a common problem. But then people chiming in saying like, no, it, it works fine every time. And I'm like, no, it just doesn't. Like, I'm sorry. Like, I'm, I'm glad if it does for you. But I've professionally covered PlayStation for 10 years, and no, it doesn't. This, the, the PlayStation Store just doesn't work. I have four PS4s. I've connected them to many internet connections. I've down, I have like 550 games on PS4. So I have a little bit of experience on the PlayStation Store. It doesn't work. And they, that's the big thing is I want them to create something that's reliable. When I go into Gmail, it loads, right, on my browser. Yeah. When I go to Twitter, it loads every time. When I go to the PlayStation Store... Maybe, maybe it'll load. The longer the PS4 is on, the less likely it'll load. People have all these, <laughs> people have all of these connection uh, issues and these tricks. Like you got to go to test your, you got to go to system and test your connection and then cancel out. And then that will make the place like all this weird shit. This seems to be a console thing, man. Like I've, I've noticed the same thing on the Xbox front and it's just like, this does not work. This doesn't load a lot of the time or it just takes forever. Or it's like really slow. And it's like, why is it so slow? It's a UI. Like what? I'm not loading in like a massive world. Why can't I run Sekiro at 60 frames, but I can't scroll past the games that I don't want? It's very strange. On a storefront. 
It's very strange. Like I, I don't get it either. And I don't, I, my experience with steam is limited, but steam is so sophisticated to me when I use it where I'm like, wow, steam works fine. I'm like, this is it's, it works great. And again, it's sophisticated. Like there's all of this shit, you know, message boards and communities and people voting and reviewing games like there's way more that needs to go into the PlayStation Store. So it's not only functionality. It's like I would really love a situation where I'm playing Days Gone. So I click on a little Days Gone icon and it just brings me to this whole array of shit for Days Gone, a dedicated forum that's connected to the browser forum, people who are playing it around the world. The Days Gone is a single player game, but maybe people pleading for online help or walkthroughs. And there's like all sorts of cool shit you can do. And they don't do it. Yeah. So I really think that Steam remains, and I know this is true with the Epic Store and people comparing them, like Steam remains what everyone wants to make and, yeah. and wants to uh, achieve. And and I think that that's a good goal. I would love to see something like that on PS5, like a real thing that keeps you there, you know, and not just this weird, like here's who vaguely who's playing. Here's some vague communities. Here's a person you don't know that's playing a game because they have a check mark next to their. It's like, I don't care about any of this. Yeah. So a long way to go, Chris. Number four, Dreams, the long in development PS4 exclusive that recently went into paid early access on PSN is getting its first major update in May, according to Game Informer. The update, which will come via patch, will add more tutorials to help players as well as templates from which um, which to work off of. New creator assets, a new level cap beyond the old level cap of 100. I didn't know there was a level in uh, Dreams. That's cool. And Dream Reverse related tweaks, including, I think, the ability to block people, which wasn't there yet. Game Informer also notes that the dev team is working on non-motion controlled options for the experience since many are finding the motion controls cumbersome and annoying. While it's unclear when the full version of the game will come out, this version came out in mid-April and cost $29.99. It's Media Molecule's first full release since 2011's Little Big Planet 2 on PlayStation 3, though a small internal team did release the Vita game Tearaway, which came to the handheld in 2013 and was ported to PS4 in 2015. I forgot that they didn't make... Uh... Little Big, Planet, Little Big Planet 3. No, Sumo Digital made Little yeah. Big Planet 3, another British studio. So they're still working on Dreams. Obviously, they're going to be working on Dreams for a long time. There is something interesting, though, Chris. I have an interesting story here. Okay. In 2013, I was at Gamescom. Or is this 2000? Yeah, 2000. No, I think it was 2013. And I went out to dinner with some people from Media Molecule. Very nice people. Mm -hmm. Went to this Italian restaurant in Cologne, Germany. And I remember talking to one of them. This was before Dreams was even announced. And they and I was talking to this person and they were like, what do you we were talking about PlayStation Move and what do you think of move controls and all this kind of stuff? And again, remember, this is six years ago now. And they're they're like, we're, I'm like, are you making a game based on motion controls? And they're like, yeah. So they were talking about dreams. And I'm like, that's a horrible idea. I remember telling them, that, I'm like, you cannot make a game based only on motion controls or revolve around motion controls because people will not adopt them. And lo and behold, <laughs> six years later, <laughs> Colin ultimately, ultimately always ends up right Colin was right number five is anthem in trouble it seems like it even as publisher ea and developer bioware continue to insist that all is well and that updates and new content are en route unimpeded for starters website push square points out that players are reporting on various message boards like reddit that they're having a hard time finding full lobbies of players particularly during off hours and for early game content indicating the game has a small hardcore group of players and little in the way of new traffic coming through the door However, it's important to note that all of this is anecdotal and that pound for pound, Anthem remains one of 2019's best-selling games to date. Website Games Radar points out that three key members, and they put key members in quotes, of the dev team have already left the project in what could be described as its, as its most dire state. Executive producer Mark Dara, lead producer Michael Gamble, and lead director Jonathan Warner. It seems these guys, all of them have been moved on to Dragon Age 4, or at least two of them have. The game is now in the hands of Ben Irving and Chad Robertson, the game's producer and head of live services, respectively. Chad Robertson tweeted out that, quote, we remain 100% committed to Anthem and look forward to showing players the new content we are working on. We want to make sure we aren't overpromising." So our updates on what's coming in the game will be focused when we have things near completion, end quote. And perhaps another piece of admittedly anecdotal evidence, however, that tweet has fewer than 200 retweets and just over 1,500 likes. The reason I bring that up is because when someone says something about Destiny from the Destiny team or someone says something about Apex Legends or something, it's like tens of thousands of retweets. Yeah. So Anthem's in a lot. Of, I think Anthem's in serious. I, I personally, I'm just putting it going on the record. I think Anthem's in a lot of trouble. Oh, yeah, no. Matthias Lutz Ramos wrote into us, Chris. He said, hi, CNC. Last week, you guys talked about Anthem, Fallout 76, and how these are quality failures. Maybe that's happening because studios try to pursue the new hot thing, but games take three to or more years to make, and when they get done, the market doesn't care that much for the thing or doesn't have high, or does have higher expectations. Thanks again for the great show, and forgive me for my broken English. This is not my first language. I worked around it. It's all good. 
Chris, Anthem, what do you think? What's happening? Uh, <laughs> it's not looking great. And I, I wish I could say that I didn't see something like that coming, though. You know? But I don't know. Like, I feel like a lot of these things are like, what a surprise. But it's like, I feel like it's really not. Like, you could kind of tell real easily from a lot of the a lot of the games that have like been a really big disappointment you can kind of tell it's really not as untransparent as a lot of people think it is i feel like if you know the industry well enough and you have like you know what to keep your eye on you can see these coming from a mile away absolutely i said in december in a, in a very popular tweet that still i still see it gets re i call it i'm like they're really worried about this game and they have every reason to be worried about it because it's empty. It's supposed to be a shell of a game. It, it, it's a game, as we know from Kotaku's extensive journalism uh, and journalistic reporting, that it was a game that was created under massive duress. It was created like yeah. I think the core game might have been made in fewer than 18 months, which is really insane. And because, you know, our writer, Matthias or Matthias wrote in and said games take three or more years. Typically, yeah, three to five years is, is a good incubation period for a game. It seems like this game actually entered production as we know it with 18 months to spare, maybe. And you know, I, I wanted to bring up Matthias's question, Chris, because it's what we talk about often. There's just too many games and there's too many games as a service. So Anthem is entering an arena where people are completely satiated. And I'll also say that I think EA fucked its own game by releasing Apex Legends. I mean, I, I there are definitely people there are yeah. definitely people that are playing Apex Legends that would have played Anthem. And that are now playing Apex Legends. I don't know if it would have been enough to save it, though. Maybe not. I, I think a lot Maybe of... Not. The, the second that I heard that, like, Anthem di wasn't going to have a PvP component at all, I was immediately like, what? You're making, like, an always online shared world shooter without a, without a way to keep people being, their, being each other's new content? Like, that's the whole point of PvP is to keep, is to allow for new experiences all, like, every minute. Because you have a new group of players constantly fighting each other and you have to learn different... It's a way different game than the base, like, campaign gameplay. And that keeps people coming back to, to dead games, even. Like, there are still people playing single-player games with multiplayer components from, like, 10 years ago. So the idea that you would just cut that out of your game, to me, means that they didn't really know how to make the game that they were making. No, I think that they don't Or what have they it. needed to do to make that game. It's like the Kotaku piece said, they don't have the expertise to make these kinds of games. And they didn't look at any of their competitors, so they made a game in a vacuum. Yeah, they weren't allowed to. Exactly. It's, it's, it's making a game in a vacuum. It's not necessarily a good idea because, again, to the point we got in the letter, Chris, because of the incubation periods of these games, this is why being a follower is so dangerous in the gaming industry. And this is why I really get disturbed. We often use the Fallout 3 example of just the o the overwhelming amount of open world games that are still coming out to this day really started, I'm not saying open world games started with Fallout 3, the rush on open world games started with Fallout 3 and you can tell just from where games started to come out in 2011, 2012, 2013, games that were clearly inspired by that era. And it gives us positive, it gives us net positive games, but I just don't think being a follower in such a saturated, player-focused, time-focused ecosystem is a good idea. If you're competing with the likes of Destiny, you're competing now with your own game by your own choice in Apex Legends, you're competing with all of these other products, these MOBAs and everything, you gotta make a good game. You gotta make a good game. It's Nothing else is gonna cut it. And I, I'll say, I'll go on record right now, Anthem's not getting all of its content and they're gonna shut that shit down. I think that, I, I don't think it's gonna be anytime soon, but Anthem's not getting all of its content. You think this is in a No Man's Sky situation? It would be nice because for them to go away and come back out, Destiny did, it wasn't this bad with Destiny. But no. Destiny did a similar thing, right? There is basically a Destiny 2.0, right? I mean, it, it basically got better after. But yeah, it came out. for sure. But I would. Uh, Destiny was th the problem with Destiny was that a lot of people were unhappy with the story content, and a lot of people were unhappy with the lack of things to do. But the game itself was very well made and very polished and very fun. This is not the case with Anthem. I don't think. I don't think Anthem has a lot of appealing really anything to draw in a new crowd of players and and keep them in with like oh the base gameplay is a lot of fun i don't think it has that maybe ea and bioware chris will do or make a similar move to what turtle rock did with evolve where they just make it free but again this <laughs> this will just compete with apex legends yeah this is i really and then that would damage a lot of the goodwill for the people who paid money. Exactly. So like, there's, it's a it's a no win scenario here. And that was exactly why the Fallout seventy six rumors were so strange. That didn't end up going free, even though that was a rumor. Because again, yeah. you fuck people. And Fallout seventy six sold substantially. And that's another company, Bethesda Game Studios, and Bethesda as a publisher that insists that their full roadmap's coming. 
even though the game seems to be truncating a player base. But I think Fallout 76 is doing substantially better than Anthem. I could be wrong on that. Like, I think that it's has a bigger audience, much because of what you're saying. It can be played alone. So or it can be played against other players. And there's all these different options. Fallout 76 is 100 percent like a, a broken mess. But honestly, like I, if, if I were to pick a game to play, if I were to pick Anthem or Fallout 76, I'd probably play Fallout 76 before I played Anthem again. For real. Like, because at least, at least Fallout 76 is broken, but at least it's something that I can recognize as like there's fun there. Right. Somewhere. If I dig enough. But yeah, like, I don't be- know if it's beating hard. Anthem is just, it just feels like it just wants to string you along until you get to the end game of which there is none. So like, I don't know. I don't know. I, I can't it's going to be a rough roadmap. I think you're right. I, I don't think it's, I think they're going to shut it down and maybe focus on Dragon Age or whatever the hell. I, I can't imagine it being a, a good gamble. You have to play it out at least long enough to make people not even more mad at you. you yeah. Know? The interesting thing would be, I don't, I don't even know if you could do this. The, there's some interesting moves. You could discount the game heavily. You could stop selling the game, which would be an interesting move until you fix it, which I would really like something like that. Being like, listen, we're shutting this thing down. And you're not going to be able to, if you have the game, you're not going to be able to access it. It's no longer for sale. We'll come back later. And I think that that would be an interesting move. They're actually doing, this is not a great uh, comparison, but in Japan, there's a Disgaea mobile game that was really popular by uh, by Nippon Ichi Software. And Disgaea obviously is huge over there. And the the game was so broken that they literally was like, we'll be back later. You know, they they literally just took it down. That's awesome. So is that the right move? And would that build actually goodwill for electronic arts i think ea is in such a pincer between all sorts of players that hate it that anthem is simply the realization of what everyone expected and i hate to say that but i expected this and that's such an interesting dichotomy right because i didn't expect apex legends and even when apex legends came out i didn't think it was going to be huge at all so i just don't understand why they won't get out of their own way they and there's all these it's just there's no planning going on there it's the same thing with respawn like Respawn's working on Titanfall. They're also working on Apex Legends, which is a Titanfall branded game, technically. They obviously didn't expect Apex Legends to be big. It ended up being so huge that they then cancel basically Titanfall 3, which is in development. There's no organization. They don't even have they don't even have reasonable expectations about how their games are going to do. Like, I don't understand who's running the show over there. It's, it's really strange. It feels like a mess. It's strange. I feel like they're probably going to wait until... I feel like Anthem is just going to keep kind of chugging along until maybe Jedi Fallen Order comes out. And then, like, they've got some goodwill from that, maybe. And then they'll be like, hey, listen, we're going to maybe slow things down on this. I feel like they need to wait for good news. Right. And they're not really having a lot of good news lately. Not at all. Even with Apex Legends, because Apex Legends is is dwindling also. Is it really? Yeah. Yeah, I was going to say, like... They have steep competition with Fortnite. Epic, well, we're going to talk about Epic in a minute. I mean, they're dealing with someone with unlimited amounts of money and resources and that update their game constantly. It's just it's just really weird. It's just a really weird situation. I appreciate trying things. I appreciate doing new things. I think that's great. We talk about Gorilla all the time. Gorilla made first-person shooters for many years and then just randomly made one of the very great open-world RPGs out of nowhere. So you can do it. You can make a game that's not in your wheelhouse. You can do it. But... It didn't turn out well. And EA, everything that EA does is amplified and magnified by like 10. It's just it's just the way it is because everyone fucking hates them. I personally don't hate EA, but a lot of gamers really do hate EA. They really yeah. do. And they're looking for reasons why they fuck up and oh, for- shit on them and stuff. So it's like <laughs> no, a game. For sure. I still got a chip on my shoulder about pandemic, if I'm being honest. That's really old. It That's, is an old one. It ain't going away though. Did you buy uh, what was it, the saboteur? I did. You did. So you so you you weren't part of the problem. Right? I know what I loved. Pen, I loved pandemic. Number six. Epic Games has made a substantial purchase. The San Diego-based studio Psionics, the team behind the very popular Rocket League. Psionics is now a fully owned developer working internally for Epic and will continue toiling away on Rocket League while undoubtedly also working on new projects. Changes on the console side are expected to be minimal to entirely non-existent. Epic noted that Psyonix will, quote, continue to bring the full Rocket League experience across all platforms to all current and new players all over the world, end quote. The specific details of the acquisition are unknown and likely will remain so, though with its stable and engaged audience of millions of players, it's likely the price Epic paid was substantial. I want to call out here Jeremy Dunham, who founded my very first podcast, Podcast Beyond, is a VP over at Psyonix. I want to congratulate him. Uh, I, I don't want to put anyone on the spot. I don't know their details. My assumption is that a lot of people became millionaires over there. So many congratulations to the Psyonix team who I have a great affection for. Rocket League's a great game. They deserve it. 
Kendrick Lukenbach wrote in and said, hey, Colin and Chris, the news of the Epic Games acquisition of Psyonix was an absolute shocker. I think Rocket League and Fortnite have been big third party hits for PS4, specifically with their content through PS Plus. Should Sony continue to build its third party relationships with Epic moving going into the PS5 as Epic asserts some dominance over the games industry? Thanks. And always remember, keep fucking that chicken. Of course, everything Epic does on PlayStation is 30 percent Sony's. So, of course, they're going to want them to do as much as humanly possible. Yeah. Every dollar that is spent on Rocket League, 30 cents goes into Sony's pocket. So there's no reason for them to discontinue or be worried about Epic. In fact, a powerful Epic is really good for the first parties, in my opinion. Unless yeah. they make a console or something, which they're not going to do. Yeah, no, for sure. Uh, so huge acquisition by Epic. Yeah. And this caused a lot of consternation, Chris, in the PC community. Not at all in the console community, because apparently they may be stripping the game off of Steam. Yeah, which it would which be a, is questionable. Yeah, and I don't think that they're going to end up. I think that's a bad idea. It, how do you feel about, um, what's his name? Oh, t- uh, Tim, Tim Sweeney. Sweeney. He's I appreciate his audacity in a way because he yeah. basically said we're going to stop spending all of this money when Steam gives developers more money and until then we're just going to keep doing what we're doing. Yeah, it's really weird. It's really brazen. I appreciate it, but I also don't believe him at all. <laughs> There's no way. What, what do you mean? So you're saying like if if if, if uh, Gabe Newell comes out and, and walks out of the Valve's offices like and uh, screams on a megaphone, we're now we're sharing the same amount of money as Epic is that they're going to be like, oh, OK, never mind, Sionix. Like, what? You're not going to just roll back on all your exclusivity deals. You're not going to, like, stop all the plans you have for future exclusivity. There's no fu- There's no way. I don't believe that at all. No, that, also, either. that's like an awful business I practice. That's like a w- horrible way to do business. I agree. Because what you're basically sa- you're basically saying, we have a worse... I don't think anyone thinks the Epic Games Store is anywhere on the level of Steam. So we have way fewer services, and so you're paying for way fewer services by paying... You know, you're keeping less of the money. I mean, it's it's like a transaction where it's like you're, you seems like you're keeping an appropriate amount of money based on the service you're giving me. And uh, I, I find that a little weird. I do appreciate Epic getting involved and in trying to shake things up, though. No, for sure. The 30 percent standard, it, 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 that's across everything. Like if you sell a game, it's 30 percent to the platform holder. That's always the way it is. And so for them to say, like, no, why? Why? Why do we do this? Why isn't it way less? Why aren't developers keeping way more? It's a move. It's a play. I don't think it's a play that is incredibly, unfortunately, maybe relevant to gamers. They don't really care. They just want the most convenient platform and the best platform in which to play their games. They don't really care about the rev share. Maybe they should, but they don't. So, maybe they will if enough developers bounce. But like, I, I just think like people care about this on the PC space, and they they probably should. But the uh, Steve Steam does demand a lot, and it's a bit ridiculous Agreed. when you compare to what Steam really does. Is they just kind of upload a file. <laughs> like I don't imagine it's anything more complicated than that, really. No, and I'm sure macros take care of the development of all of the boards and stuff and associations. Yeah, so, so yeah, I, I appreciate this sentiment, and I think it's a, a justifiable sentiment. I don't dislike Epic as much as a lot of people do, just because of this specific kind of thought process. But I still think it's like, dude, come on, you're not gonna stop exclusivity deals. Just it, it, there's no way. Number seven. Bloodstained, Ritual of the Night, the long-awaited spiritual successor to the Egovania Castlevania-style games, finally has a specific, real, tangible, and apparently concrete release date. It will be coming to PlayStation 4 as well as other platforms on June 18th. Nerds. Remember that while it was originally revealed to be coming to Vita, that version of the game was canceled. Ritual of the Night was revealed back in 2015 and was a crowdfunding phenomenon. However, it's also being delivered well outside of its promised window. It was originally slated for launch sometime in 2017, making it at least 18 months tardy to market. The game's creator, Koji Igarashi, is better known as Iga, and was a longtime Konami employee who cut his teeth on some early Castlevania games before assistant directing one of the most famous games of all time, 1997 Symphony of the Night. He then went on to produce every subsequent Castlevania game created in that style, as well as others before leaving Konami unceremoniously nearly a decade ago. Bloodstained will be his first full game since 2011. He, of course, also helped make the the interstitial Curse of the Moon game as well. Yeah. Azan wrote in and said, Hey, Colin and Chris, with the announcement of the release date of Bloodstained, what is your true and honest expectations of the game? Especially that you, Colin, were part of the announcement of the game itself back in 2015. So I need to say that, yeah, I was intimately involved with the origin story, I guess, of this game. And so you should take what I say with a grain of salt, obviously. And I'll continue to reiterate that when we talk about the game so you know. The game was basically uh, launched from my apartment and uh, like the, <laughs> the, the, the Kickstarter and, in San Francisco, and I hosted their Twitch stream to launch it and, and get money and stuff like that. So uh, I have a relationship with Koji Igarashi and that team, and, and I don't want people to get the wrong idea. I'm going to give you my honest opinions on the game one way or the other, but I understand if you don't believe me. 
That said, to Hassan's question, I think it looks great. And I think it's going to be fucking awesome. I think you're a nerd. I, I'm here I, to balance it out. Yeah, no, you definitely. You, it so looks you, terrible. So you don't. So you don't care for Metroid side scrolling Metroidvania? Oh no, I do. I'm just being an oh, asshole. Okay, fair <laughs> no, I actually haven't seen anything about it. I kind of um, with these kinds of games, especially because I just feel like a lot of them kind of start to look the same after a while. Like the, just the that kind of art. Is it pixelated still? Is it no, like no? In it's the not 2.5D. Unfortunately, oh. I wish it was. The pixelated it's way harder to do that than it is for two point to do 2.5d so yeah that's the reason yeah i don't know I, I typically wait for those games to like appear on my lap and then i just kind of play through them blind because I, I i've seen enough trailers for anything at this point i'm overloaded with trailers i don't watch trailers for anything i didn't watch the borderlands 3 trailer i've been watching that a lot actually because <laughs> my roommates won't stop watching it because we're all excited we're all weirdly strangely excited about borderlands in my house again I don't know what the hell that is because we haven't been that excited since like maybe 2009. I was like, oh, that looks kind of neat. It's wild. It's good. They, they're uh, hitting. Some, it looks cool, by the way. Being excited is good. It and yeah, looks, I, I saw little little glimpses of it, of it in screens and you stuff. Can melee uh, barrels towards people now. It's it's wild. I'm excited to play it. I don't. I'm just really of the mind. I become more and more of the mind that I just don't want to see footage of games. Like when a game is announced and you get the little embryonic thing of what it is. This is a you know a looter shoot whatever the case might be. I'm like, okay. I'll see it when it comes out. You know, that sounds there, there great definitely comes a point <laughs> when you're, if you're Spider-Man PS4, where you, you get a little bit, get a bit, a little bit overboard yeah. with uh, your your trailers. But sure, for the most part, I. Oh know. my god, yeah, that was like there was like a new trailer every five seconds. Yeah, it was too much. Number eight, Rage Two is officially gone gold, meaning that the core game is done and ready to be sent out for final certifications and manufacture. The announcement comes by way of publisher Bethesda's website and notes that the game is still on target for a May 14th release on PlayStation 4 and elsewhere. The posting also notes that while the PS4 version of the game will run at 1080p while capped at 30 frames, the PlayStation 4 Pro will run the game at 1080p capped at 60 frames a second. The original Rage was somewhat quietly released in the fall of 2011 on PS3 and elsewhere and is certainly one of its id's smallest games in terms of fan base. Its sequel, however, is being made by Avalanche Studios, the guys behind Just Cause, Mad Max, and most recently, the abysmal Generation Zero. Tony Rivera wrote in and said, a good day to my, pa my favorite pair of C's that I can interact with on a, day a weekly basis. Hashtag bachelor. Oh, it's a little sexual. <laughs> good. My question is for Chris. How excited are you for Rage 2? Have you seen any gameplay on it? I can tell you that I have watched some of the developer press events and the game looks incredible. Avalanche Studios and id Software making a baby is a dream come true. I just want to go throw in again. Id isn't making this game. I hate how I, I understand that Bethesda, it's Bethesda's fault for confusing everyone intentionally. Yeah. But id isn't making this game. The fluid speed and FPS mechanics of Doom mixed with the fantastic explosions and open world mastery of Just Cause is pure genius. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Until next time, thanks for all you do and keep stroking that goose. Yeah, no, I'm I'm stoked on it. I think it looks really cool. I'm I'm uh, I've always liked those kinds of like id id software shooter style uh, games and like especially now with like the open world. I do think I I'm expecting it not to be I'm expecting it not to be as good as Doom. Or even probably even half as good as Doom Eternal, just because I do, I don't know if you can really keep up the very intentionally placed enemy placement, and just like the way that combat flows in those linear games. I don't know if you can keep that kind of adrenaline pumping in an open world setting as effectively as you can in like something like Doom. But it, it looks pretty cool. I, I imagine I'm gonna have a lot of time. I'm, I imagine I'm gonna have a lot of fun fighting. I just wonder how fun it's gonna be to traverse because I don't know if that's gonna be great we'll see but I, I'm, I'm excited I'm, I'm looking forward to it i think rage 2 has a lot of potential i think yeah. rage 2 has a lot of critical potential certainly but i actually think it has a lot of commercial potential because yeah. people have their whistle wet now with single player centric looter shooters and borderlands 3 is still far away so this is like an interstitial game that i think is coming out at a perfect time yeah unintentionally coming out at a perfect time too because borderlands 3 wasn't even revealed when this game was like you know announced to come out so i'm really excited to play it yeah, I'm, I'm really happy. I'm really happy that we've we've we're into this kind of weird renaissance of of single play of triple A single player high octane FPSs. I'm I'm really enjoying this, and I hope it lasts for a while. Yeah, me too. I hope I hope so too. And it just requires us to go buy and play these games, uh, considering they're good. Then they're going to keep making them. But we are in an interesting renaissance period. I agree. Just with high quality single player games, generally not even shooters. Yeah, we're just in a really great place right now. So. Anyone, I, I, it's but so shooters funny. for a while have just been like so multiplayer centric, you know, like yeah. it's always been like, oh, you playing the new Call of Duty, did you get the map pack? And it's like, fuck you, get, a, get no, stop. No, I didn't get the map pack. I've been kneeling here outside this Far Cry base for five minutes, <laughs> seeing if this guy will move. Number nine, 
A story spotted by website Video Game Chronicle seems to confirm that we're probably not going to get a new Child of Light game from Ubisoft after all. As you may remember, back in August of 2018, we reported on word that Patrick Plourd, Child of Light's creative director, tweeted out a picture of the original game running on a Switch, with a document clearly and intentionally visible in the background that said Child of Light 2. However, Plourd told Video Game Chronicle that the short document tease was basically four or five pages of the game's major beats, and he basically didn't mean to get folks' hopes up. Quote, I don't know if there's a Child of Light 2 that is in production. Ubisoft is big, but I'm not working on it. Right now, I don't think there's a Child of Light 2 being produced. I'm not holding my breath, end quote. Candidly, Plourd, who still works at Ubisoft, said, quote, I don't think it's the type of game that Ubisoft wants to make. The company is not an adolescent company. It is a mature company. And the other things in terms of portfolio, it's still supported. We ported it on Switch and we're still selling a bunch of copies. But it's just that right now it's all about games as a service. We can make money out of it, but you can make more money elsewhere. That's the problem of not being independent while making this, end quote. Child of Light originally launched in April of 2014 on PS3 and PS4, as well as other platforms. It was ported to Vita in the summer of 2014. Damn. That's too bad. Child of Light, for people that didn't play it, is an, what's called a UB art game. And it's a side-scrolling, really beautifully drawn role-playing game. It's very short. It's turn-based also. It's turn-based. I like it a lot. It. Yeah, Chris doesn't like turn-based games. And it's just something really special. It's something you can really play in a day. And I, I highly recommend you go play it if you didn't. And I just brought this up because a lot of people do love Child of Light. It was a, a released around the same time as Valiant Hearts, which was another game yeah. in that same vein. That was an adventure game, really. But... It's disappointing that we're not getting another one because I, I I thought Ubisoft was taking some risks with, with not only those games, but also with like Rayman and games that are clearly not Assassin's Creed level, but that, you know, I, I thought that they were more willing to play on the low end and it, it appears they're not. Yeah, that's a shame. Number 10 is a wrap up. Ubisoft is hosting a mysterious website for a company called Scale Technology that teases a Ghost Recon related announcement from May 9th. By the time this podcast hits free feeds, that news will have already been revealed. So we'll find out what that's all about. And website Push Square reports that JRPG Trails of Cold Steel 2 is indeed PS4 bound on June 4th and that 2016 PS4 and Vita visual novel Root Letter is getting an updated version only for PS4 called Root Letter Last Answer. Chris, it's also worth noting that right before we started recording, a new state of play was revealed. State of play for people that don't know is Sony's new Nintendo Direct style performance piece. Yeah, their last one was very VR focused. They're going to show Medieval in this one and apparently announce a new game. I think we made a mistake by waiting for that to make our show. I'm not even going to be around to record for that show anyway because I'm going to Massachusetts. We can cover it on Monday. So we'll cover it on Monday. I doubt it's going to be anything major. We'll see though. Yeah. Chris, it's time to talk about the new games. There aren't too many of them this week and I will allow you to pick going first or going second. I'll go first. Let's do it. Doling's Arcade mm. comes to PS4. Doling's brings unique gameplay mechanics through its interesting characters and world uh, while combining together the best that all known Ar- Arkanoid? Arkanoid, yeah. Arkanoid, ga- oh shit. Arkanoid games have to offer, uh, polished with a modern look and design. I didn't realize it was an Arkanoid game. Yeah. An Arkanoid style game, which I love. Well, look at that. For the King comes to PS4. For the King is a strategic RPG that blends tabletop and roguelike elements in a challenging adventure that spans the realms. Set off on a single player experience or play cooperatively both online and locally. None before you have returned from their journey. Will you put an end to the chaos? Frayne Dragon's Odyssey comes to PS4 and Vita. An odyssey to the world below. Set out uh, set out for and search. Wait, what? Set out f- that, that's what it says. Okay. I, again, these are all, all right, copied and pasted. Cool. Uh, set out for in search of a missing girl. And venture out into a fantasy uh, action RPG. Take on enemies with weapons and magic in quick-paced action battles. Explore dungeons, craft items, upgrade weapons, cook dishes, and enjoy your quest with a variety of original col- and, and colorful characters. Lost Artifacts Soulstone comes to PS4. After the Soulstone is stolen during an auction in the National Museum, Claire and her helpers witness the revival of the Terracotta Army and its Emperor. Go on a journey through a country full of myths in this exciting casual strategy game in the casual strategy game, Lost Artifacts, Soulstone. Nice, Soulstone. Nice one. Lovecraft's Untold Stories comes to PS4. Lovecraft's Untold Stories is an action roguelite with RPG elements. Explore randomly generated levels based in HP Lovecraft stories, uh, fighting cultists and monsters from the mythos, improving your weapons and gear, solving puzzles, and looking for ways to defeat the Great Old Ones and the Outer Gods. Hmm. Sounds interesting. My Big Sister comes to PS4 and Vita. My Big Sister is a game about two sisters trying to return home after being kidnapped by strangers. Across multiple chapters, players clear puzzles to advance through the game's story. With many secrets and multiple endings, you'll have to you'll have your work cut out for you to get the ending the sisters deserve. Party Arcade comes to PS4. Party Arcade is a family-friendly uh, party game set in a virtual modern arcade. Starting with 13 addictive games, players collect tickets, unlock equipment, skins, and battle against family and friends at home or online around the world. 
Poyo Poyo Champions comes to PS4. Jump straight into fast-paced puzzle action with features fit for both friendly rivalries and competitive tournaments. Challenge your friends and family in local multiplayer or compete against players through online matchmaking. Built for all ages, this classic puzzle game has a surprisingly competitive edge. I like the way this is written, this one. Reverse Crawl comes to PS4. You're dead already. But such a trifling inconvenience isn't going to stop you, the Revenant King, from reclaiming your throne. Reverse Crawl is a fast-paced turn-based strategy RPG. That's a lot. That's a lot. Also, how could it be fast-paced and turn-based? Anyway. Yeah, wow, interesting. Uh, that lets you uh, that lets you lead mobs of monster minions and back from the grave goons into into battle against elite armies of dastardly of the dastardly Red Queen. I like that. What yeah, maybe, it maybe it'll be cool. I mean, I love turn-based strategy RPGs. Such so. a trifling inconvenience. Finally, Shakedown Hawaii comes to PS4 and Vita. Shakedown Hawaii follows three protagonists through a 16-bit open world filled with missions, side quests, arcade challenges, and empire building. Build your own legitimate corporation by sabotaging competitors, rezoning land, and more. The entire island is up for grabs with the right business model. Uh, again, this game looks awesome. I cannot, I still, I gotta say, I cannot believe that this game doesn't have a platinum trophy. It like absolutely fucking. Oh, this is the one that doesn't have a platinum. It kills my excitement for it. That's. Are you really excited for it if that will, that will kill your excitement? No. I guess not. That's that's a good point. Like, are you excited for Castlevania? Like, what if Castle the new Castlevania doesn't have a have a platinum trophy? Would that kill your excitement for it? It would hurt my excitement for it. I played all those games already. the The idea of playing yeah. the games it's different in that case because I want, I guess you know, that's fair. But I understand. I don't want to be that much into the meta game, but I am, Chris. Alas. And now, Mr. Raygun, as we always do, we'll end with listener questions. Eight of them. If you don't mind, of course. if you'll allow it. Remember, you could support us on patreon.com slash Collins last stand to get every episode of this show and my other shows early and ad free. This also allows you to submit questions, comments, concerns, thoughts and ideas to our show, just like Adam Lambert did. Now, isn't Adam Lambert like a singer? He is. Uh, yeah, he was in some band. I think he was in American Idol or something. And mm. All I know now is that he sings for Queen. Oh, now. interesting. So I'm glad. Thank you for taking the time to uh, listen to our show. Yeah. Good day, sirs. Hello for Pittsburgh. He says hello for Pittsburgh, but I think you meant hello from Pittsburgh. <laughs> I was wondering if the news of PS5, they will either allow you to delete trophies or maybe opt in or out of collecting them. My ex's nephew insisted he show me how cool Umbrella Corps was now. And now that one trophy haunts my dreams. Thanks for all you do and keep up the good work. So I wanted to bring this up, Chris, because people bring up why can't I delete trophies? I want people to really think about this. I want you to think about why you might not be able to delete your trophies. Just think what could what could be the answer? Do you can, can you figure it out, Chris? What? What if I signed into your console mm -hmm. and I just deleted your, your trophies one day? Yeah. I mean, that's why you can't delete your trophies. It's really that simple. So people that are always wondering why you can't do it, it's because it would be so catastrophically easy to fuck everyone else. Now, I do think we should be able to hide them. You can. And I do think but you can't hide them from the anyone hooked into the back end. Don't ignore all those. It, like, so I, ha I have trophies hidden on PSN. But if you're looking at PS, PSN profiles or PS3 trophies or something or PS trophies .org, that they ignore that. So it doesn't matter. I do think that they should give you the ability to delete either one percent trophies or under five percent or whatever. If you don't want them, that might come in the future. But you guys have to remember, if you want to delete your trophies, it's simply they simp it's simply not an option because it, you it's so easy to fuck someone. on. I, I would be mortified if someone fucked with like my shit, you know, <laughs> and so that's why there, there's never going to be an option to delete trophies. But I do think that, you know, they, they do give you now to delete zero percent lists, which is not necessarily a new option. And so maybe they'll will allow you to delete some other lists in the future. But that's the reason. And I think that a lot of people just don't think about that when they when they inquire. So I wanted to throw that out there. Cody home wrote it and said, hi, guys. That's actually a reference to knockback. What are your thoughts on the seemingly childish nature of dialogue from much of the games media and consumers today? I am referring to the continual whining about the Epic game store, microtransactions, race representation, game difficulty, etc. We are so privileged to live in a place where these are even considered issues. Are we simply devoid of problems with any consequences? So we resort to searching for new ones, or could this simply be a product of the need for daily content creators to have something to talk about? I am 27 and I've played games my entire life. Never have I lived in a time of such seemingly meaningless whining. Maybe I'm in the minority, old, or not as in touch with the medium as before. Would love to hear your thoughts. Keep up the great content. You two love birds. Thank you, Cody. Nah, people have always been complaining about dumb shit. It's just now that there's like a platform for it to be sent to the entire world. Right. And now you can get clicks on it. I'm of two minds here. I agree with you. Mm. People have, since the origin of time, right, probably complained about things that were completely irrelevant. I have no doubt. I complain about things that are irrelevant all the time as well. I just think that, well, why are games any different than films? People can criticize a film for its cinematography or they criticize like an actor's performance or whatever. That's meaningless, too, because it, it, it's a movie. Yeah. 
but we do the same thing in games and I think it's good. I think it's important actually to cr constantly be criticizing, to constantly be looking with a wary eye at the art we consume. No, I don't think there's for sure. Wrong with that. Yeah. I think, uh, I think also it's just that there's a lot of, um, I don't think it's that we're devoid of problems. I think a lot of the problems that we're left with are pretty big ones. <laughs> and then it's like, ah, oh, that's a lot. I don't know. What, what are they doing on Epic store? What's that? that that's pretty bad. Right. Uh, whatever. <laughs> Right, so you don't have to worry about like nuclear war. Or you don't have to like worry that. about the th threat of nuclear war, the bubonic plague resurging. <laughs> yeah, that was a weird one. I wasn't too comfortable with that one happening. Oh, you'll be fine. I do agree with you though, Chris. Like, it, it, it's just the nature. Of, I think it's human nature to complain about things, but I also think it, it adds vibrancy and 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 a relative feel to our industry when we're constantly looking at things through a critical lens. Yeah, for sure. I agree with people that, and I've gone on about this more than most, that I think that we're looking at things through the same lens over and over again, the same political lens, the same sociological lens, whatever the case might be, even an anthropological anthropological lens. And I think that that's boring. But I don't think looking at things through critical lenses is bad. And I don't think no. saying like, oh, there's too many black people or, or, or rather too many white people and not enough black people in a video game. That, that is a, certainly a valid piece of criticism. I, I, whether or not you agree with it or not, I just don't want people to draw parameters in which like this kind of criticism isn't allowed. It's like, well, you can yeah, really yeah, criticize can the game for whatever you want. It's a matter of like whether or not it vibes with you or not, you know? So that I think is most relevant. I don't want people to just get caught up. You see, games media is so homogenous that I think we're starting to get the idea that like things are always just looked at through a single lens. And, and that's not true. And maybe he's right. Maybe people do need to churn and they do need YouTube content and all this kind of stuff. But I'm not like a major consumer of games media. Like I don't read almost any games website. I don't listen to any games podcast. I don't I don't really watch YouTube videos. I read as it comes through my feed. I have sources. I'm interested in what I'm interested in. And so I think it's also about how much you immerse yourself in these. So I, I miss most of this shit because I just don't pay attention to it. Yeah, I do think there is a bit of, um, you know, we got to get an article out. Oh, in definitely. time and like that definitely plays into it but i also just think like every every generation has their own point where they take things way too way too serious like every i i remember like when 2016 was happening like this is the most important election of all time and it's like it was the, it was the most important election last time it was the most important election the last time it's going to be the most important election next time it's just going to keep being the same thing so just maybe everybody calm down and uh, have the conversations that you want to have without jumping down each other's throats. Good and, advice. And then we'll all be fine. Very good advice. And also don't eat diseased marmot in Thailand. No. Or else you'll die of the bubonic plague no. in 2019. No, don't you don't want to do that. Matthew Mango wrote into us, and I think it's how you say it, M-A-I-N-G-O-T. It's not spelled like mango the fruit, but rather French mango. He says, hi, CNC. Hope you guys are doing well. Wondering what you think of the impact of open world games on game storytelling. Red Dead Redemption 2 told a great story, but it always felt like the story and the gameplay were very disconnected, both from an experience perspective and from a design philosophy, linear story versus choice-based design. I'm still early in into Days Gone, but similar story here. How can developers better align their gameplay and story while still delivering these open-world experiences? Matthew, I wanted to include your letter because I totally disagree with you about your assessment of Red Dead. Now, I agree with you about your assessment of Days Gone, but I think Red Dead is the greatest single example of intertwining open world with narrative in seamless ways. That's really surprising. I mean, you're entitled to that opinion. No one's right yeah. or wrong. But that's a really surprising take to hear. Well, I opinion. think I think he's referring to specifically some of the linear design, the, the linearity of, of the missions that take place. Because I remember one mission, uh, a friend of mine who I actually did uh, an interview with uh, on, uh, on the Snark Tank, uh, Nakey Jakey, he, has, he does great videos. But we talked a lot about Red Dead and like how there's a specific mission in Red Dead where it's a stealth mission and you're encouraged to sneak into this mill to steal a document from this dude. And the way the mission plays out, it almost begs you to climb the building and sneak in through the window, but the game doesn't let you do that. It, it forces you to go through a very specific, you know, you have to go through the bottom, you have to kill the people at the bottom, and then you have, you have to go up to the second floor and kill those people, and then you burst through the door because the cutscene demands... Arthur to burst through the door, even though there's very there's the game so open when it's not in story mode that it makes you start to think that, oh, I could probably get in there through this way like I could in the open world. But no. So like there are definitely aspects. I do disagree. I think Red Dead is probably one of the better examples of it doing it super well. But there are moments like that that are kind of at odds. And I do understand the problem with them. But I don't know what I don't know what I could what advice I could possibly give. <laughs> <laughs> to, to to the people who mastermind Red Dead, you know, like maybe get maybe do more to ensure that there are more than one cutscene. to. I don't know. That's a wild ask. 
Yeah, I guess you're absolutely, well, I don't guess, you're absolutely right in the sense that a game like Red Dead does everything really well until it, it forces you into a tunnel. Yeah. And that and is, I guess, a pro that's a great point. It's a problem with every game in terms of the open world philosophy. I get frustrated by that with open world games too. Like, why can't I hop over this fence? Or like, why can't I jump on this box? That was like, bothering me in Borderlands. Yeah. Like sometimes you could see like you could jump over a fence, but like the game won't let you for some reason. Yeah, there's no bar Yeah, there's like artificial barriers or whatever. And I understand they don't want you to break the game and all this. But yeah, th that's like the frustrating things that gamers just kind of take on the chin, I think, over and over again. By Because even in Days Gone, that happened where I'm like, why can't I just I can like climb over this thing, but I can't climb over this. Thing. Like, yeah, it, it seems like arbitrary. We have to live within these parameters and these rules. So it's a good point. So maybe I'm wrong there indeed. But Matthew, I appreciate you submitting your question. Yeah, I think maybe as like cutscenes start becoming more dynamic and more like part of the game engine and just like continuations of what's happening in the engine, I think maybe next generation is probably going to see a, a huge improvement with that. But I don't know what advice I could give as far as like how to make that better. I just think they need to take more choices into account. Maybe think about the way people are playing those games versus how they want people to play them. But they're already working 100 hour weeks. <laughs> Gonzalo Nellis wrote in and said, hi, CNC. I have a question related to the relation between the developing side and publishing side of video games. I'm fairly new to this ecosystem, and I recall some episodes ago, you mentioned that the majority of people have no idea how games are actually made and the impact that the development developing team and the publisher have in the final product. I surely fall in that category, so could you provide an example uh, or an explanation of this relationship? With Sekiro, for example, it seems that Activision has little to no influence in the direction of the game. So what was its role in the game development? Was it only funding? And what about the games that have different publishers in different regions? How does that work? Keep up the good work, and sorry in advance for my broken English. I'm not a native speaker, as you may have guessed. I thought your English was, yeah, I thought it was arguably good. better than Chris's. Yeah, 100%. Now, all right, so uh, I, I guess I think I could explain this from a high level. So Sekiro was made by From Software. From Software is an independent Japanese developer. Activision is a publisher, an American publisher. At some point, somewhere, they cross paths. Maybe they send emissaries to each other. Maybe From actually sought out Activision. Maybe Activision sought out From. I imagine Activision sought out From. I heard that From actually sought out Activision. Is that true? I, well, I heard that. I don't know. That would make We're sense if you want shit. money. However, whoever found whoever, right? Like a lot of, so I guess I should back up and say that a lot of these relationships occur and a lot of these talks happen at GDC behind closed doors at E3 and hotel rooms uh, across the world. Like that, that's why E3, like what happens on the ground at E3 is so different than what happens behind closed doors at E3. And I'm not only talking about people seeing games for the first time and stuff, but I'm talking about the deals that are made. I know plenty of people that are deal makers that that are literally assigned signing games and they do that all at these trade shows. So that's the way it happens. So these people pursue each other and there are deals that are made. Now, here's how I suspect the deal with Activision and, and from went whoever approached who. From makes the game in Japan, Activision side producers are assigned to that game. So Activision has people that are working for Activision that are assigned entirely to that game. And usually there are roles of executive producer, producer, and associate producers. And they're the ones that are basically making sure From is doing all the work. Some of them probably live in Japan. Others are probably always, always going to Japan over the entire course of development. They hit different uh, beats and different, uh, you know, they hit different goals, uh, different milestones. Those all get checked out or whatever. My suspicion is that Activision had very little to do with how From developed the game, but to say that they had nothing to do with the choices made are, are probably not true. Activision funded the game and therefore had, I'm sure, final, final say through their producers on what the end result would be. So this is kind of a high end and really, you know, I don't want to say not wholly accurate, but a really like one page way of how these things work. And then the second party in Sony, that's ex exactly the same. Like Spider-Man was made by Insomniac. And Spider-Man is a Marvel property and Sony published it. So Sony has producers working on it. Marvel also has producers working on it. And then Insomniac is making the game itself. So that's kind of how it works. And then they have a marketing budget and they have milestones to reach and they release the game. And who knows how they cut the money from could have been paid up front from could have also gotten paid up front and then gotten points on the game. They could have Metacritic goals for bonuses. They could have sales goals for bonuses. So I don't know if that brings any clarity, but that's kind of how it works. Yeah. Ben T wrote into us, Chris, said, hey, CNC, I was pleasantly surprised to hear that God of War will be getting a behind the scenes documentary this year. We talked about that last week yeah. or two weeks ago, especially because God of War 3 included a very solid one with its release. However, this announcement made me wonder, why don't more games regularly do this? One of the primary reasons I still collect Blu-rays is the paint is the plentiful extras that can still in be included on discs. But it seems like 99% of game extras are just galleries or character models rather than anything insightful. Some games do have in-depth making of features like the original Bioshock, but these seem to be few and far between and it feels like a missed opportunity for developers to share their artistic process. Is there just a fundamental difference between film production and game design that makes these a rarity in gaming? <laughs> I don't know. 
I, I remember when I went to went to, went to school for film. Like one of my one of the things that I wanted to do was to be one of those people to like make those like docs for the, for the studios or like do, document the development process for a lot of these studios. But a lot of the times I have to wonder like I think about when I'm working on something for a really long time, I'm not thinking at all about documenting it. You know what I mean? I'm just thinking about finishing the, the damn thing. So like the idea that they had the foresight with this very risky reboot of God of War to just kind of document the whole process on film is actually kind of a, a huge display of, of confidence. Like to be like, this is going to be good. We should document this. That's wild. Foresight is the exact word. And you know, it's an expense. It's a minor expense that they probably hired a few people. I think the major reason why some developers might be loath to do it and why this one might have taken so long to come out actually is because you're giving the keys to the kingdom to people with cameras and shit. I mean, like I I've gotten all sorts of leaks off of people, things that things that people shouldn't have recorded shit, dude. I remember when there was a last of us video that PlayStation put up when I was still at IGN and I broke this thing frame by frame down. This was after last of us came out and there was clearly art for uncharted four on some people's machines. And I remember, set, uh, and we wrote about it. We, we broke that story and wrote about it. But I remember sending them to Sony for comment and they literally emailed me back like a minute later and like, where did you get these? Like insinuate, that's what they did, like insinuating that someone went into the studio or like, I, and I'm like, they're in your own video. You literally ruined the game yourself, you know? And so I think that that's kind of wise because like it requires so many eyeballs. You have to be very careful. So I think that the reason that this one came out so late, not only to commemorate the one year and the success of the game, but also probably took a lot of time to go through that and make sure are we showing anything that didn't make the game? Are we showing anything from the sequel? Did anyone say anything fucking weird? You have to like kind of like, yeah. like figure it out and then put it all together. So I wouldn't want a documentary crew in my fucking house documenting what I'm doing. So I don't blame them for not wanting to do that either or that not being the default. You know? Yeah, no, for sure. They're That's, always a treat to watch, though. I, I'm, yeah, I'm excited too. to watch I, them because I, I love this this kind of stuff. Me too. I think it's great. And. I'm excited that Sony did it, and hopefully now we, we will just realize that maybe Sony maybe has been doing this with a lot of their games. Yeah, hopefully. I mean, that, that uh, I watched that Bioshock making of with Jeff Keighley and, and Ken Levine probably at least a couple times a year, just because I think it's just fascinating. Corey Savas wrote into us, Chris. Said, hello, gentlemen. I recently went back and beat the campaign for Call of Duty World War II. As enjoyable as it was to me, I can't help but feel that linear FPS campaigns have run out of ideas. What can developers do to reinvigorate the genre and make single player FPSs feel new again? You're a big single player, linear, first person shooter player. I think I like them too, but you, you more than me. Yeah. Is it the kinetic gameplay of because Doom's linear, for instance? Yeah. Is it, a, sure. is it is it just the kinetic nature of the gameplay that you're really looking for? for or, it's or just well paced. I think pacing and, and well, let's be real. Call of Duty World War II is a multiplayer game with a single player component. I don't think anybody would really argue anything else. The whole game has to be balanced for multiplayer. It's a huge success for the multiplayer. So much so that, yeah, there might have been plans for multiplayer or a single player in Black Ops 4, but they clearly were fine with cutting it, and it really didn't affect much of anything. So I don't know if I would levy the same criticisms of single player FPS to the campaign of a Call of Duty game, because I just feel like they're just designed for way different audiences and designed with way different goals in mind. The design, the goal of like a Call of Duty campaign is to just kind of teach you how to play the game for the multiplayer. Actually, I, th I think. And to just deliver you just kind of, like, kind of like a basic story to go along with it. Whereas Doom, the whole point is the song and is the dance of combat. Like you're learning how to play the game as you play it. And it's like, oh, this could be <laughs> like, what was, what was the website that had that horrible Doom gameplay? Was oh, it, that's, was it, was uh, it Polygon? that's right, Venture Beat. Was it Venture Beat or yeah. Polygon? Ven oh, po oh, Polygon had Doom. Venture Beat had Cuphead. Right. Right, right, right. right. Polygon okay. had Doom. Right. So you watch that and you're like, wow, that looks terrible. And then you see it in the hands of somebody capable and it's like, this looks wild. Whereas I feel like if you were to give Call of Duty World War II to somebody capable, or if you were to give Call of Duty World War II to somebody who was novice, I don't know if there would be that big of a leap in like how that game looks. So like, and Doom already kind of reinvigorated the single player FPS kind of feel to me anyway. I don't know if this person's played it. Maybe not. Right. Because if they're if they're talking about Call of Duty World War Two, maybe not. But like I would get, I, I play Doom. It's great, and it's I think it's it'll uh, it'll make you feel good, especially if you're feeling down from <laughs> World War Two. Yeah. Because <laughs> like I don't even know how to. Those are two vastly different games. Like I don't even know how to compare. I think though that you hit on uh, the the head on the uh, or the nail on the head with your 
with kind of like this idea of a, a, a design philosophy, a clever design philosophy of pacing. I know I brought it up in the past. I don't mean to be redundant, but really one of the most powerful GDC sessions I ever sat in was for Resistance 3 when they just talked simply about where why they put enemies where they put them and, and how and how it worked and when waves would come out, when drop ships would come out and why. And like, yeah, Resistance 3 to me is a really great example of a beautifully paced ambient first person shooter, single player campaign linear. And it's cool to see philosophies like that because it's not only about the, the literal design of the geometry, but it's also about where enemies come out and why they come out. And that's why he brought up World War Two. But actually, World at War, the Call of Duty game, I fucking hated that campaign because they have monster closets that are unlimited that are based yeah. totally on your advancement as opposed to like giving you a, a feeling of satisfaction. So there's also that. I think finite amounts of enemies, clever ammo and health placements. Clever and useful cover to use. Yeah. And enemies not, that come out and, 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 and are aggressive and they make sense. That's all the stuff I'm looking for. Yeah. It's not easy. It's not as easy as just like throwing enemies on a map and just like, oh, well, if the game if the gameplay works, then it's fun to play because there are enemies to shoot. It's like you got to think about a lot of things. You got to think about health placements, jumps. Uh, in the case of Doom, where can you clamber? Where can you jump to? Like uh, how vertical is the room? You know, how wide is it? What uh, power ups are where? You know, I just think it's a it's a very different game when you're comparing a modern military shooter to like a, a high octane classic kind of FPS experience, and they're just very different. And I think you'd be happy to uh, I think you'd be surprised by Doom if you if you're feeling down on modern shooters. Jeremy Miller wrote in to us said, "Hi there, Colin and Chris. I was wondering what your thoughts are on buying pre-owned games from places like eBay and GameStop being the solution to not supporting crunch. Think about it." Most of the people from the game sales goes to the top people with most of the staff receiving much smaller bonuses. If you buy the game pre-owned, you're playing and enjoying the game as the coders, artists and designers, etc. intended without giving extra cash to the higher ups that enforce these ridiculous practices. I don't really see what the smaller workers in the company get on the back end of a game's development aside from the knowledge that people are enjoying the game they work tirelessly on. I don't know. Maybe it's my lack of video game development knowledge in regards to what actually happens after a game releases, but curious to hear your thoughts. This is an interesting one, Jeremy, because at, at first... I was like, what, what are you talking about? But I understand what you're saying in the sense that the person in the trenches, why does the person in the trenches necessarily care if you buy a new copy of game X six months after it came out because their bonus has already been rendered. Most game sales happen in the first month of a game anyway. And the publisher is probably not reaping much of a reward. I'm of the mind that you should buy your games however you want. I don't really, I don't think you should look at the downstream as being the most relevant thing of why you buy something. Like if you buy a used car, do you, like you buy a used GM truck, are you really like worried like, ah, my money didn't go to fucking General Motors and therefore the guys on the ground didn't get the money and it's like, it's like, no, you bought a used car because you wanted to buy a used car. That's why you bought it. Yeah. Someone bought that car new at some point and then you're buying it used. If you care that much, and you should maybe care that much about the health of a publisher, the health of a developer, go buy the game new because definitely they're netting the most benefit. But a used game being in the wild means that that benefit has already been rendered once. So I'm really uh, I'm really in the middle on this one, Chris. I don't know exactly how you feel about it. I just don't think that it's a good response to crunch specifically. I think you yeah. really just have to worry about your money and how you best want to spend it, how you most judiciously want to spend it. I used to be of the mind that like, yeah, buy new, support the publisher. But who the fuck am I to say that? You know, like who am I to really say something like that? It's your money. If you want to fucking get it off the back of a truck, that's not really my business. I don't think yeah. that's the right way to do it, but that's not my business, you know? So for sure, do it however you, however I'm not going to tell people how to spend their money, Yeah, exactly. but I'm also going to be like, you know, if you, if you support, if you like a developer and would like to see those developers continue to make cool shit, I would suggest, yeah, buying no, if, especially if it's something that you know that you're going to fucking love, which is the case for most people who buy stuff new, I think. Typically, you're not going to make, oh, Fallout 76 looks like shit. I can't wait to buy it new. <laughs> I don't think there's anybody in the right. world <laughs> that thought that, you know. But, yeah, I mean, you do what you want. I don't I don't think it's a good, like you said, I don't think it's a good response to crunch because crunch is like its own kind of beast. Yeah, these are um, totally isolated from each other. I, I just, you know, I used to really, again, try to encourage people to, to put their money where their mouth is. But this is kind of putting your money where your mouth is. I think that. If you believed in GameX so much that you really wanted to play it, you were excited, it was a critical darling, whatever, then you would have bought it new. The only thing I have a real problem with that I will say is like when people spend $50 on a used game that costs $60 new, that's fucking insane. I mean, if 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 you... you might as well just buy it. No? Yeah, like just buy it. Like especially with $54.99 to $59.99, buy the fucking I stopped game. buying used games a long time ago just because I remember like there was a string of like two used games in a row that I got that were just scratched to shit. And like, just like, okay, well, cool. 
now <laughs> and they wouldn't take it back or they wouldn't take it back that sucks and it, yeah, it, was, it was really shitty so i was like no nah, i'm just gonna buy it new then at this point like i'd rather just and it was always like those like oh 45 and it's like i'll i'll pay another 15 bucks to ensure that the damn thing works yeah I, i've said this before i i don't think that gaming is generally a hobby for people that don't have at least a little bit of disposable income sometimes i'm not saying all the time but like of course like video gaming is a it, it's a luxury and so I've always been of the mind that if really five or ten dollars means that much of a difference, then maybe you probably should just be putting that money in the bank. Yeah, I mean that's always that's always I kind of I kind of think that way. You know too, what I mean? Yeah. Like I'm I'm a real conservative person with that stuff, but like I always think that when someone's like I only have six, you know, I just got paid, I only have fifty dollars to spend. I'm like maybe you should just save it. Yeah, it bothers it kind of bothers me when I'm at like a a gas station or something, and they're like oh, I gotta get like oh, is there a coupon for this water? It's like, I'll buy it for you. <laughs> just, let me, I, just let me get out of here. I need to get out of here. Yeah. <laughs> I don't got time for this. Bart Jacasa has the final question for the week. Chris, he says, hey, Colin and Chris, oh, hope you one. two are well. This is quite a long one. Feel free to trim it down. I didn't. But it's something that's been on my mind as a fan of PlayStation. Do you think that the most under the radar misstep by Sony this generation is the quality and quantity of output in the PSN exclusive ecosystem? During the PS3 era, I feel like there was a much more vibrant ecosystem that had plenty of games that are well rem remembered by PlayStation fans. Games in this era include, note all these IPs are owned by Sony, Fat Princess, Puppeteer, Puppeteer is a retail game, AAA game, Unfinished Swan, That Game Company's Trilogy, Tokyo Jungle, The Last Guy, Dead Nation, etc. During the PS4 era, I feel as if exclusive PSN ecosystem has diminished both in quality and quantity. There are only a few standouts like Resogun, but other than that, the output and decision making has been very disappointing. Games like Killstrain, Guns Up, Entwined, Hohokam, The Tomorrow Children, Drawn to Death and Bound were very underwhelming compared to what Sony offered last generation when it came to PSN. Even abandoning the Edith Finch IP when it went on to win a bunch of industry awards is another mistake I feel Sony made since that would have been given them the high quality PSN exclusive game. So what happened? Has Sony just lost its footing in this regard? Or do they even care anymore about the specific aspect of their ecosystem? Because if they don't, and it sure seems like it, that's really disappointing to me as a PlayStation fan. Thanks and all the best. I think these are just the platforms in general because Xbox also has a thing where they like they were pretty big with the uh, Xbox Live Arcade back in the day. They had Summer of Arcade that had like Limbo and like like a ton of like Explosion Man, Super Meat Boy, I, I believe. A lot of great stuff and like this generation hasn't really seen much of anything in regards to that too. So I, I don't think it's a Sony specific problem. You're probably right. This is an identifiable problem. It's happening. Yeah. But I think it's a unfortunately because I like those indie games. It seems to be a move in terms of like it's just not paying off. Sony makes decisions based on what makes the money. Yeah. And you'll remember that Sony was incredibly invested and dedicated to the indies, as you were saying, in the late PS3 era, in the Vita era, and in the early PS4 era. In fact, they had like the the PS logo heart indie shirts. Oh, yeah, yeah. And all that kind of stuff. And it was, it was real. Like they would have events where they would have literally 40 independent games and that was it. Like no AAA games, no first party games. And they were really going all in. And I remember some of these, some of these games were great, like Mercenary Kings and they they like really were into it and then suddenly they weren't. And as I've said on the show in the past, I've heard from my independent game developer friends, especially guys who have sold a lot of games on PSN that they, Sony just treats them differently. Uh, their games are not as important. Uh, I've said this in the past. They don't get blog posts. They don't get promotion. Uh, any of the things like that. I think Sony looks at it. I think the major reason for this, Chris, is every game this generation is digital. That wasn't the that's, case. That's also the case. That was, wasn't was the case back then. It. Yeah. So in the PS3 era, for people that don't know, you didn't have to release your game digitally. And in fact, a lot of people didn't. If you released a game on disc, it often, more way more often than not, wasn't available as a digital download. Yeah. In P on PS4, every game has to be available digitally. Every one of them. That wasn't common until like, I think maybe like 2011, 2012. Right. So I think that also plays into it where you just have fewer games to compete with because back at, when Dead Nation came out or something, it was like, I, I've said it in the past, like there were they, there were months on PSN where there were like two games. Yeah. And so like those games got a lot of attention. And then there was your retail channel of games that were coming out at a store. And I think things have just evolved away from it. If you're spending X amount of money on a game that costs $9.99, Sony gets $3 of that, uh, 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 you know, that cut. But they look at it and they're like, well, we can just spend more money and time on a triple a game and then get twenty dollars and if they're first party by the way we just get all of it so to me i, I look at it and i'm like i think it's just an, an unfortunate economic reality that these games were simply not hitting anymore and we talk about studios like housemark that were very much in that ecosystem they were the, they were the key player in that playstation ecosystem for digital games for a long time with super stardust and dead nation and all that and the fact that they're even moving away says that those games just don't sell And that's an unfortunate thing. So I think when you go online today and you see Fortnite as a digital download and you see Days Gone as a digital download and you see 
uh, Rage 2 is a digital download, and then you see a small $4 or $5 game as a digital download. It's just not appealing anymore. To yeah, both, to I, I think a lot of it, I don't even think it's that it doesn't sell. I, I, do, I do think it's it comes down to the fact that it's just a crowded ecosystem now compared to where it used to be. Because just like Summer of Arcade back on the Xbox ecosystem, yeah. it was just like, that was it. Like that summer came and that was it. <laughs> that was all you got for a while. Yeah, and, and, and um, great games came out. Too. Yeah, no, they were all fantastic. Pretty much, I can't think of a single one of them that I didn't like in some way. It was like Mark and the Ninja and, and yeah, Shadow Mark Complex. And the Ninja. And Shadow Complex was a big one. I didn't play Shadow Complex until recently, actually. I love that game. But yeah, it's not. Scary. I love the book too. Uh, it's based on a Orson Scott Card book called Empire. I did not know that about uh, an American Civil War in the modern time. That's cool. So, so the book or the game is about him breaking into the rebels. The rebels take over all these military complexes. Was that an epic game? Also, yes. That's wild. <laughs> Holy shit! It was. A, I think Epic published uh, the guys that made Infinity Blade, who I think are Epic internal Epic Studio there in Utah. What the fuck are they called? I can't even remember. Shit. The the mustards, like the the Donald Mustard and his wife. The fuck are their names? I don't know. I can't think. Of, anyway, I think Epic owns that studio, but they made Infinity Blade and all that, and they also made Shadow Complex. So, to me, I I, I don't know. I think it's just not as. I think there are too many games, and like Chris said. The digital offerings came and were like gap fillers, and now they just come out as you see seventeen times a week. It's kind of wild to think that like indie games had digital space, <laughs> and triple A's were like relegated specifically to discs. That's interesting, and it's also interesting how many people, dude, people became millionaires off yeah. of selling their games on Xbox Live and PSN years ago. And I don't know that any that's happening for literally anyone anymore, but I could be wrong. You know, the guys at Drinkbox, the guys at you know the guys at at Housemark, well, they sold lots and lots. It probably and lots could and lots still be happening if they didn't flood the store with just shovelware. Agreed, one hundred percent agreed, one hundred percent agreed. Alas, uh, alas, Chris, that it's is probably the, just going to get worse. <laughs> the next generation, I, good lord, it is going to get worse. It's going to no doubt get worse. Oh boy, Chris, that's all I have for Sacred Symbols episode forty-five. Forty-five, man, we're getting close to fifty. In fact. I have my brother making a special piece of art for episode 50 for us that we will sign and send out to our highest end subscribers uh, on Patreon at the end of the month. So I'm excited about that. Also, remember, you can buy our merch again, tinyurl.com slash sacred shirts. You can support us on Patreon, patreon.com slash Collins last stand. Chris, do you have any final or closing comments before we leave? No, no, I don't. I'm really starving. Oh, OK. Well, we'll let you can out I of here. So you can eat. Real <laughs> no, well, we'll let you eat. We'll let you go and, uh, and satiate yourself. Have fun with Lola. Uh, and I uh, I, we'll talk about how that all went in a, in a candid fashion on Monday for yeah. our next episode. Thank you all out there for your love, your kindness, your support, your generosity. We generosity, generosity. Thank you for your generosity. We appreciate everything you guys do for us, and uh, we'll see you next time for more Sacred Symbols. Goodbye. Take care. Sacred Symbols, a PlayStation podcast, is a product of and a registered trademark of Collins Last Stand LLC, and is recorded right here in sunny Santa Monica, California, USA. This show is conceived by, is written by, and is produced by me, Colin Moriarty. My co-host is Chris Raygun. You can find me on Twitter at No Taxation and on Instagram at CLS Moriarty. Chris is on Twitter at Chris R. Gunn and on Instagram at Chris underscore Ray underscore Gunn. Sacred Symbols is edited by Dustin Furman. Any snail mail can be sent to the CLS P.O. Box, P.O. Box 1233, Santa Monica, California, 90406. To message the show online, please use Patreon's DM service. As you know, all of Colin's Last Stand shows, including Sacred Symbols, are fan-funded on Patreon at patreon.com slash Stand. The following names are at the producer level or higher on Patreon, and we are eternally grateful for your kindness, generosity, and fandom. Carlos Algaret, C.J. Anderson, Morgan Ashley, Taylor Barkley, Sean Battershaw, Martin Beck, Michael Betts, Eric Bishop, Mark Boggio, Eli Blosford, Barrett Boswell, Miguel Brewer, Lennon Brixey, Josh Bushing, Austin Bullock, Andrew Burkhart, Dylan Burns, Chris Buston, Alex Cabrera, Brian Cacciatolo, Tom Cargill, Patrick Carper, William O'Carroll, Ryan Caulfield, Brian Chan, Travis Chandler, Sean Chandler, David Chestnut, Simon Conception Jr., Brad Cooley, Geo Corsi, Nick Cummings, Daniel Diamore, Colin Davenport, Daniel Delanicos, Mitchell Durkash, Knight Draft, David Ellis, Martha Emery, Joe Fin- Nelly, Eric Finkenbeiner, Candler Four, Photios Frangos, Michael Gallier, Chris Galvin, Connor Gashian, Alex Gates, Michael Gates, Salem Ghanem El Ghanem, Daniel Glassford, Tyler Goodwin, Josh Gravelick, Miranda Grubba, Tyler Harris, Kyle Hagel, Wyatt Henry, Asa Haas, Azan Isa El Ricey, Josh Yeager, John Jameson, Joshua Jonathan, Greg Julius, Anton K, Jeremy Key, Antti Kinnanen, James Kinzel the Third, Ryan R. Kittredge, Jackson Lastiqua, Joe Lawson, Don Q. Lee, Patrick Leslie, Dustin Lewis, Keith Adrian Lewis, Chad Lewis, Lou and Ray Loper, Elijah Lopez, Colin Love, Josh M, Ryan. 
Brian T. Mandel, Peter Mark, Michael Martinez, Sean Mason, Zachariah McAdoo, John McCarthy, Joe McPartland, Dennis Meinchin, Andrew Mendoza, Christopher Middling, Albert Miranda, Betty Ann Moriarty, Abe Mukhtar, Ryan Murdoch, Brian Nietzsche, Adam Nix, Donnie Nolan, George Anthony Nunez, Brian Ott, Jorge Palomino, David Parkhurst, Todd Paxton, Brendan Peavy, Marius S. Peterson, Enrique Perez, Nicholas Perfect, James Perrone, Jason Pettit, Jeff Pollard, Louis Powell, Lawrence F. Prokop, Ryan Reeves, Michael Renner, Peter Reynolds, Shane Rayum, Jonathan Rice, Mark Richardson, Tony D. Riemenschneider, Austin Riley, Petro Rose, A.G. Rowe, John Schultz, Michael Shanholz, Brandon Sharkey, Toby Schutman, Glendon Cole Simper, Joshua Smallwood, Andrew Smith, Daniel Strycharsk, John Tambanillo, Ahmad Tamar, Joseph Thayer, Ben Thompson, Carl Tolman, Alan Tremblay, Jacob Turnbaugh, Phil Van Ralt, Raymond Vargas, Michael Vecchio, Oakley Waldron, Justin Wagaman, Isaac Wastman, Damon Weathers, Mike Wayant, Corey Wyatt, Tony Zuniga, Toothless Gibbon, Casual Misfits Gaming, Supershot ST, Homeworld Hub, Throw7, Infinite, Mad Mock Media, Fabian, Mubarak, Richter86, Hugo's Desk, Andrew, Ian, Chris, Donk2015, and Gavin.